Hello, everyone. Audiobook Collection here. The upcoming audiobook is a special dedication to one of our incredible Patreon supporters. If you're interested in making your own personalized requests, consider becoming a part of our Patreon community. You can find the link to my Patreon account in the video description below. Your support means the world, and I'm thankful for you joining me on this thrilling audiobook journey. Also if you want audiobook of 300 plus novel you can visit my Kofi shop where you can buy a Google Drive link for just $35. Chapter 1, Beto. I am Beto, an elite hunter of the Dark Blade clan and inventor of the Predator Techno Armor. A male specimen of my species. I was navigating back to Yautgea Prime after hunting a Xenomorph Hive by myself. It is something I like to do once a year. My ship jostles violently and alarms start blaring. I run myself to the cockpit and find out my ship somehow had the bright idea to go through a supermassive black hole. I take a look at my NAV coordinates and find out my I misinput a single number. The coordinate number was supposed a 1, but I pressed 2 by accident. Fuck, well, let's hope I reincarnate somewhere cool again, I say in acceptance. There was no way I could escape from the center of a supermassive black hole. I don't even know how my ship isn't crushed right now. Also, yes, I'm a reincarnated person. I was previously human, I died and was born to a female Eurasia. That process of birth was quite an experience. I could be considered lucky though. I was genetically modified through different stages of my development in my mother's womb. As a result, I became even bigger, stronger, faster, and smarter than even the general genetically modified larger variants of my race. My clan went all the way modifying me. I stood 2.75 meters, 9 feet, tall and weighed 363 kilos, 800 pounds, of pure muscle. I became an excellent hunter, the serpents were no match for me and the umans were no match either. Umans were what we called humans. Hunting my previous kind wasn't that bad. It was kind of fun watching them desperately struggle and use any tricks they could. I could see why humans were a prized hunting prey for us. No one could even tell how long I would live. Which is neat as my kind live hundreds of years naturally. Now, my ship violently rocks and I'm now in space in the middle of nowhere. My ship is damaged, but my ship is made from nonites. It will self-repair in due time. For now, I try to see where I am. My ship computer shows that none of the surrounding stars or planets are recognized. I'm in uncharted space. Fuck, I say in English. I speak in English when I'm on the hunt for omens or alone. I land on a jungle planet with my ship cloaking active. I started walking around cloaked and started to remember the scenery here. I think, wait a damn moment. Isn't this Felucia? I find a small village of farmers that look like, Felucians. I am in the Star Wars universe? Haha, <laughs> this is going to be fun. I should gleam some information from these spice farmers. I see an old Felucian walking around and approach them after deciphering their language with my bio helmet. I uncloak as I walk towards them wearing my black techno suit with green visor and lights. I do my signature predator clicking and popping noise that I will refer to as clicking. I asks in a deep voice, Elder Felucian, I need a star map. The elder trembles and gulps, I have a star map, here. The elder gives me a hollow pad. I take the pad and leave without a sound. I take the time to kill a Felucian village scout on my way out since he was alone though. Not the best of prey, but still armed with a bolt rifle. It is still new genetic material, so I'll still took the time. I take the information from the hollow pad and the ship's navigation is updated. Perfect, the star map also had dates on it. I'm 20 years before the invasion of Nebu. This gives me a lot of time to hunt. I'll have my research AI work on creating a space bridge back to my previous universe, or galaxy. I still don't know if I really did jump universes or I simply jumped galaxies. I then have the thought, there are many humanoid races in this galaxy too. Perhaps I can finally not be reluctant to have sex. Yautgea females aren't exactly appealing and it felt wrong to copulate with prey. Hopefully, I can find a female alien I find attractive whose race I haven't hunted. I start thinking, no what, I won't hunt humanoid races at all so my taste for them doesn't turn into disgust at the thought of copulation with them. Good old-fashioned killing won't count though, nor bounty hunting. For my first hunt, I was thinking a goatl. I guess my first destination was Anter 4. I'll have to capture some force sensitives to find out how they tick too, hee <laughs> hee. Chapter 2, First Hunt. The goatl is a worthy first prey. They are ugly, and have interesting biology. Their cones are M, electromagnetic wave, detection emitted from their cone horns. They can sense mood, infrared emanations, radio waves, and practically every kind of energy radiation. These cones made them good hunters themselves as they can sense if a prey is wary of their presence or not. Their cones are also unique as they also sense the energy field of a force-sensitive being. Hunting them first will provide many new tool for me. I hope to improve my bio helmet through analyzing those horns. A force vision will hopefully be added too. Just like my xenomorph x-ray vision that's tailor-made to seeing the serpents, the force vision will be tailor-made to see force sensitives and even the force itself in time. It is not long until I reach on Tal 4, a planet 60% covered in water, almost as much as Earth. It did not take long because Yautgea spacecraft are much more advanced. An example would be how a ship from Yautgea Prime was able to reach Earth within a few hours in AVP Requiem, after receiving an emergency alert. I call the engine my spacecraft uses the Quantum Tunnel Engine or QTE for short. Of course, the ship I use is just a super-improved mothership that would be seen in the first AVP movie. Now cloaked above Ontal 4, 
I do a bioscan of the planet to see where the population density is. I see the settlements pop up on my green 3D hollow map. I find a somewhat small village and zoom in on it. The Gotl are peaceful anarchists, so they know government besides a judicial court to judge criminals and offworlders. Which means, a small village like this has no police. It mostly comprises of hunters using bold rifles. I wait until night before taking a scout ship down to the surface 10 miles away from the village. I leave it cloaked as I disembark. What weapon should I use for this hunt? I think about the various weapons I have amassed. I think, plasma cannon would be too easy. Let's go classic, collapsible hunting spear. One of my oldest and favorite weapons, it has served me well over the decades. The most I've done to change it, is reforge it with stronger self-repairing metal. I'll have to get my hands on Biscar later too, I plan once I remember the rare metal. Gotl hunters have no preference for night and day, but this village has few night hunters. Gotls can sense the M field of technology, so I was going primal. No invisibility, no tech, just my spear, and classic metal alloy armor. I did bring a little toy though, as I have said before though, I'm genetically enhanced. Enhancements I continued to do on myself as I collected more genetic code throughout my old galaxy. Despite my size, I was quieter than a mouse. I moved fast, and smooth with great agility. I found my first goat hunter in time. I was 500 yards away, but my improved red spectrum infrared vision could see just fine. The goat was on the hunt, but had no inkling he was being hunted. I creep closer from the side jumping from tree to tree in the shadows of the night. Once I was within 50 yards, the goat sensed some time and turned my way. I am impressed, those cones are indeed useful. I bring out my little toy, a lure that can give off an M signature the rough strength of the prey of this world. The goat immediately looks towards the lure I threw. He goes after the lure, more curious about it, than me. The goat comes upon the lure which is just an orb. I jump and land behind the goat and stick my spear through the goat. The goat soon dies and I take the body back to my scout ship for research. I then head out again to find one more goat to make into a trophy. I find another who has just shot his prey and is working on tying it up. I cock back my arm while it is unaware. I throw the spear from above and the goat is impaled and stuck to the ground. Its body goes limp in a few seconds. I jump down and retrieve my spear. I then reach down and stab my hand into its back, grabbing the spine. I then rip out the spine along with the skull. I let out my signature predator roar and return to my ship with my hunt complete. One for science, one for the rack. Chapter 3, First Upgrade. I had gone to my lab room on my mothership. The goat was on a dissection table surrounded by advanced medical robotic arms hanging from the ceiling. I had various analytical and scanning machines around too. I began my research into the goat's cone's horns. The entire head was carefully dissected and the cones removed. The cones were brought under extreme analysis for weeks to replicate their sensory abilities. During those weeks, I was conducting other research to hide the M field my techno armor has. While it is fun to hunt primal style, I do love my techno armor. I would prefer to use it on serious hunts. I completed this project and another while the cones were being deciphered for their secrets. I am alone on my ship, but I do have a bio lab. A bio lab were embryos of hellhounds, otherwise known as the Eurasia hunting dogs as in the movie, Predators. I started their incubation process in artificial wombs. This first generation will be vanilla genetic code. I modify every subsequent generation to my needs as they appear. It would do be equals me good on hunts. It will also do me good to have some company by familiar beings. As I will be alone for centuries unless I find a way to create more Yautjia. For simple species, such a thing is easy. Yautjia are complex beings with crazy genetics though. To create them without defects from only DNA will be extremely tough. The secrets of the goat cone have now been uncovered by my technological marvels. I do not incorporate them into myself though. I add the function to my bio helmet to replicate the sensory capability of the cone. Now I can see an electromagnetic field and energy field vision. Finding force sensitives won't be a problem now. Fighting Jedi or Sith is out of the question for now. I am confident in my martial abilities and hunting techniques, but their powers can be strange and unexpected. For now, I will hunt Assyrian next. Although they are an endangered race, that just makes them more desirable to add to my collection. Their dual brains in their skulls is also interesting. Their precognitive abilities are on PAR with Jedi. Only strong Jedi masters can match it through mastery in the force. It makes them excellent fighters. Their reaction times even exceed mine from what I know. I want that speed of thought and nervous system. Then I will go after the Chwilax. They are a special race. To be seen as only a slave population is such a gross undervaluation of their true worth. I must find the location of Syria though. It is not on the star map I was given. However, Ord Mantle is on the map. The crime world should have the star maps I need to travel to Syria. As far as I know, the council is run by Falling members. Maybe I will hunt a council member just for fun when I arrive. I set the coordinates and activate my QBD engine. In three hours, I arrive at Ord Mantle. I arrived cloaked of course, like hell I would go through customs on a criminal world. The TSA in my human was enough experience for a lifetime. I can only imagine a TSA ran by criminals. I hover right outside the capital city of the world. I leave my ship in my techno armor. The ship will be on autopilot hovering around the city, ready to pick me up whenever I need. The Falling are known as being handsome or beautiful, but not these Falling. I seem to have come to Ord Mantle on a parade day. 
there were a few of council members on a float throwing around drugs. Listening, they were celebrating a great victory against the Pike Syndicate. Doing my predator clicks, I decide to begin a hunt. I target a council member with my plasma cannon. Three green laser points in a triangle appear on one of their heads. Then the head is gone, just like that. The other council members are whisked to safety. I follow only one who got into a hover car to drive away. I was able to intercept the hover car's path though as I ran along the rooftops. I throw three laser mines on the side of buildings set to activate right before the hover car goes through them. The laser activate and the hover car is cut into three pieces. Miraculously, the council member was cut by the laser. He tries to run, but I jump and land in front of him. I invisibly grab the falling by the throat. My left dual wrist blades pop out and I drive them though the falling's chest. I drop him belly down on the ground, dead. I rip out his spine and head and predator roar. I then take the body and go to the most popular plaza in the city. I take my time to skin the falling. I then hang up the spineless, headless falling in the plaza with a rope I picked up from the street. True to the Yautjia hunting tradition, I muse. I then go find a shop that sells star maps. I entered a shop that sells them in the form of data sticks. I took one off a back shelf that behind blasterproof glass. To get through, I went outside the shop and jumped on the roof. I then power punched the roof below me and I dropped in. I took as many data sticks as I could carry and jumped out from the hole I made. I summoned a scout ship to pick me. It came cloaked and it opened its cargo door. I jumped in and returned to my mothership. I had all the stick read by my mothership computer and found the coordinates of Syria. Time for the next hunt, I say with anticipation. To be able to hunt Star Wars species is new, fun, and so very exciting. Chapter 4, Syria. Looking upon Syria, it is a verdant world. Seeing this world remind me of a certain Jedi Master. Master Kadi Mundi, a Syrian Jedi Master. In the Clone Wars series, he was shown in a mild light. Lore-wise, he was the majordomo of being a pompous ass. Completely emotionless, zealously punishing of anything dark and so old school he should be dust by now. He was uncaring to his clones too. A literal dickhead. A prime example of falling to the light side. Anyways, I go in for a landing in the Syrian capital city. I chose the capital city because it has the most renowned and ancient of Shiarnadu martial art schools. Shiarnadu is an old Syrian martial art that uses a light arc blade sword called a Shiarn. My clan trains in all Yautjia weapons, but there is one weapon I strove to master above all. The combi stick, predator spear, was my first weapon I took a great liking to. When I became worthy, I took up the glaive. A polyarm with curved blades on each end. The blades face opposite directions to each other. I gained great merits in art of using the glaive. I proved myself a master in it, and was allowed to build a plasma glaive. My target is the Syrian Grand Master of Shiarnadu. Since this will be my first truly worthy prey, I will use my respected plasma glaive to fight her. Yes, the Grand Master is a Syrian female. I know this because I had my mothership surface scan the world's hollow net for information. This is an old planet, and an isolationist one. I didn't want to risk someone detecting an intrusion by hacking the hollow net. I decided to leave my mothership in orbit. I took a scout ship down to the city below. It was an hour into the night as I dropped from my ship in front of the doors to the school. I landed silently without a sound. The dark heavy clouds above thundered and a steady started. I had long improved my cloaking technology to work during rain or in water. I walked in through the doors cloaked. The only Syrians in the school were living disciples and teachers. I did not take out my plasma glaive for them. I stalked the halls of the school and killed Syrians using wrist blades. I did take the time to skin and hang them in rooms with high ceilings. I took out the ones on patrol first. Then the disciples doing chores. I finally visited the rooms of teachers. They were all sleeping, so I used my ceremonial dagger to kill them with a stab at the heart. They died silently with wide eyes. I hung them in their own rooms. This way, there will be no interreference from them, or alerted law enforcement. These Syrians were never considered prey to me anyways. Hence, the code doesn't apply to them. The code only applies prey. If it wasn't almost an absolute certainty they would interfere, I would let them live. I just can't make trophies out of them and can only use them for science. They are only akin to farm animals to me. I'll have their bodies researched for gene code unlocking. There is only one Syrian here that can be considered prey in my eyes. This isn't some backwater primitive world like Earth. There, it could be afforded to ignore the humans. This is Syria though, among the oldest of spacefaring civilizations. I do not want my existence to be known to the galaxy just yet. Therefore, I must unfortunately bend the code a little bit. At last, I came to a courtyard with only green grass. The Grand Master was meditating there in the rain. The Grand Master was not old, but still slightly aged. She opens her eyes, I can deduce you are here, Hunter. I was asleep when I smelled blood. I went around my entire school, only to find my disciples skinned and hung like animals. My juniors as well. This behavior is that of a hunter. I noticed the cameras you placed too. You knew and watched as I discovered your work. As I am the last, I can guess that you see me as your prize. Worthy prey indeed, I thought. I stepped into the grassy courtyard. Indentions could be seen of where I stepped. I only stepped forward a couple of times before I stopped. I then uncloaked with my predator clicking and growling being heard in the rain pitter patters. The Grand Master beheld me, what are you? My only answer was taking out my plasma glaive and firing it up. 
The Grand Master said no more as she too got up and unsheathed her Shi'ar sword. Being nine feet tall, my glaive was quite long. I towered over the Grand Master with a larger body and longer weapon. This did not deter her though as she got into her Shi'ar Du starting stance. I too got into my fighting stance. The raindrops sizzled upon my plasma glaive blades and they zapped upon her Shi'ar arc-edged sword. I attacked first with a roar. My steps quaked the ground as I ran. My first attack was an overhead where I spun my glaive once to bring my back end upon her head. She used her Shi'ar to deflect the attack beautifully. Shi'ar Du has had many millennia to be perfected as an art. She went for a counter thrust. I spun my glaive's back end counterclockwise in a rising motion to parry it. I kept the rotation going as I rested the glaive in my left arm to send out a thrust of my own. I repeated and sent out three more thrusts before she brought her Shi'ar up in a rising parry. I took that force to start a spin on my glaive which allowed me to bring across a strong and wide slash. She front rolled into me, got close and tried to drive her Shi'ar into my midsection. I was able to redirect my horizontal into a vertical spin in front of my body and deflect the attack. We continued like this for a minute that seemed like hours. She would dodge or deflect my attacks with great grace and mastery. I would wield my glaive with deadly technique, unreal strength, and great speed. Yet, the Syrian Grandmaster kept up without complaining. It has been a long time since I have had a duel of this caliber. It was exciting. This is why I hunt, I say in my Yautjia language. A language that was clicks, clacks, growls and roars. I baited her into a dodge by doing a strong downward attack brought down by my left hand. An attack she would have to dodge, as it was too strong to be deflected. I fainted that strong strike, difficultly, but successfully into into a thrust. I did this by ceasing to put strength into the attack just as she dodged and instead quickly spun my glaive. This quick spin allowed to take my glaive in a right hand reverse grip and thrust downward into her recovering form. The result was her being impaled from her chest into the ground. I had defeated the Grandmaster. As the storm thunders and lighting cracks with the rain, I let out my victory roar. I retrieve and put away my glaive and roll her on her back. I rip out her spine and head. I put it on my back. I spend some time retrieving the hung corpses as the scout ship was called in above the courtyard. I left with my trophies. The next day, no one knew what happened to the disciples, teachers, or grandmaster of the ancient school. The only clue were bloodstains and signs of battle in the grassy courtyard. I was very happy with this hunt, especially since I learned the grandmaster's name. Junandi Mundi, I growl out followed by a disturbing predator laugh. Chapter 5, The Overlooked. Back on my mothership, I had the Syrian dead researched by my machines in my lab. Since I had an abundance of research material, it only took a day to discover all their secrets and unlock their genetic code. I used all the bodies as every kill must be used and nothing wasted. Had I wasted them, I would have been no better than the bad bloods who kill the unarmed for no purpose. As my my purpose is research, it can be accepted. The dual brains are an interesting system. One brain is used for most things, while the other brain is used purely for precognitive calculations and reactionary nervous system control. This is how Syrians can tell what an opponent will do before they do it. I can only reason that my feint attack worked because of my unusual physical capability. Her second brain could not accurately read my next move because of lack of information. Had we fought longer, it would have been much harder to defeat her. Her defeat was very sweet though, especially since she was a wife of Kadi Mundi, that despicable Jedi. Now, I should be able to replicate the precognitive ability by increasing the overall density of my brain and increasing neural power. I'll need to include a biocoolant chemical gland too, I think as I ponder how to gain this ability. I do just that, in a week, I had designed my new neural pathways. I designed the new brain gland too, which in reality I just added the function to another pre-existing gland. I also took this opportunity to gain the energy sensibility of the Gothel. I had decided to modify my quills, predator dreadlocks, to do the same as the Gothel cones. I decided to do this since I was already modifying my brain even though my bio helmet already had the function. I underwent the genetic modification procedure immediately after being done with my genetic designs. The procedure took 12 hours to complete. Then it took another 12 hours of resting in a biotic liquid tub to facilitate the changes. 24 hours later, I had precognition and energy sense. I went to my training room to get used to my precognition. On the way, I used my quills to sense the various energy fields on my mothership. It took a minute to get used to, but I could use it freely. In my training room, combat bots were turned on. I decided to use a metal glaive against them. When the bots started to attack, I could read their movements seconds ahead. Cutting them down was easy as breathing as I knew exactly what they were going to do. Curious, I started to read their energy fields. My precognition took my energy sense into account and now I could even further ahead. I could read the electrical and tell what they were doing. My precognition had become even better than the Syrians as my goat energy field sense has given my precognition more information to work with. This means I can predict action even faster, and more deeply. Yautjia genetic technology is truly unrivaled. My people have been focusing on genetic engineering for many millennia. Satisfied, I went to the bridge of my mothership. It was time to pick up my next research material, the Chwilak. I will not hunt a Chwilak, I will only kill three for research purposes. The reason why I will target the Chwilak, is their unknown ability. The galaxy would remain oblivious to this information until the era of the New Republic after the fall of the Empire. Chwilak are a force-sensitive race. 
Their leka, head tails, are spiritual organs. Their language is combination of words and movements of their leku. The language is spiritual because of the leku being force organs. They are used to express deeper meanings and are jostled to express inner divinity. So all Chui Lek are force sensitive as they have Leku. It is just that most cannot manipulate the force or feel for anything more than communication through their Leku. By gaining three specimens, I will be able to see the force in an active way. This way, I can learn about how it works, how it can be used. Perhaps, help me understand how to become force sensitive myself. There are also an intelligent where learning languages is second nature, possibly another gift through their Leku. The galaxy has long seen this race as nothing more than slaves or inconsequential. Their potential and value have been completely overlooked. The fools, all of them. I will make great use of them though. Next destination, Relith, I say to my ship computer. Chapter 6, Relith. Relith, home of the Chuilax. A world with a lot of dirt to say the least. A world under the protection of the Republic. Protection that has amounted to shit. Pirates still often come to his world to acquire slaves. The local law enforcement is not equipped or trained to deal with them. Only the paramilitary forces that hide away in the wilds ever gain results in combating them. It is these conflicts where I will acquire three specimens for research. With conflict, there is no need for I myself, to kill. So, I hung out in orbit training in my combat room as I waited for pirates to attempt a mass abduction. I did not wait too long. A pirate saucer starship was detected coming out of hyperspace. I mutter, Wiki. One of the races that partake the most in piracy and criminal professions are the Wiki. The Wiki race itself is a little interesting. Stronger skeletons, thicker, tougher skin, makes them a hardy species. A regular blade will have trouble getting through Wiki skin. Even weak blaster fire will only cause burns. Their pheromone communication is also something to research. There are wiki Jedi after all. It could prove useful to confuse one if I decide to hunt one. I follow the ship to their destination on the surface. They land a few km from a small village out in the dustlands. I use my ship scanners to see if there are any paramilitary groups nearby. I am pleased when one is found. I land my mother ship a kilometer from the village. I take a scout ship to go gently warn the paramilitary Chuilax about the pirates. Their hidden base was not too far. A lot of the group were outside cooking out this night. I looked upon them cloaked, trying to see who the leader was. I found him within a minute as he walked out of the cave. I then go to gently warn him. I do this by jumping down in front of him and grabbing him. I then jump up with him upon the top of the rocky hill the cave went into. I uncloak as he faces my intimidating form. He asks with suspicion and worry, what do you want? In true predator fashion, I use hand signs to relay my words. I motion with my hands that I want nothing. This is untrue, but lies are a part of diplomacy. I then point in the direction of the village, and make my hand do a fist as if I'm crushing something. His eyes light up with understanding, you're telling me the village is about to be crushed. How? I nod and point to the stars, then I make a circle with my hands. He understands, pirate saucer ship. When? I then point down. The leader starts to get anxious, now, oh no. He turns to run and get his outfit moving. He stops abruptly and turns back to see I am no longer there. He doesn't stop to look or think as he has his priorities straight. I nod in approval of his decisiveness as I watch him mobilize his group. I get back in my scout ship and follow them as they speed up towards the village riding their gooer and speeders. When they arrived, the pirates had just begun their attack. The pirates and paramilitary fighters clashed in the village, while the residents ran. The pirates were getting pushed back by numbers. The Chuileks also had high power blasters that were actually lethal to them as Wiki. The pirates took what slaves they had already captured, which were a few of women and children, and couple of men. A bad haul for a pirate raid. Some Chuilek fighters did die and I took their bodies all stealth-like during the battle. Now that the pirates were retreating on their speeders, they became a target for me. In my scout ship, I launched some plasma shots at their saucer ship, wrecking it. Nowhere to go the pirates were grouped outside their ships looking at the flames. It was at this moment, I decided to do a mini hunt. Flames I doused using a shockwave from my scout ship. Now the wiki pirates were alone in the dark. They knew by now that someone is attacking them. So, they huddled together back to back with their catch in the middle. The only thing they heard before their deaths were some predator clicking. I dropped right into their huddles with a scimitar. A blade attached to my gauntlets like a wrist blade, but a single blade and longer. Then I started slashing. As Yaojia metal is anything but regular, they were easily cut into. I moved like water as I cut through them. They were all shooting wildly as they could not see me, only the blood on my blades. The wiki were all killed by me. It was a good fight, better than fighting cold robots. There is nothing quite like the hunting of a living thing. The Chuilek captives were fearful of what they saw. They became more fearful as the pirate bodies began to disappear. Towards the end of the collection, I heard one of the children say as I was about to go, ghost. I stopped and looked at the child. The child must have felt my gaze because the child looked straight at my eyes. I decide to leave an impression, I flash my bio helmet visor with green light so the child can see my eyes. I then leave on my scout ship. Now I had plenty of material to work with. Chapter 7, Hunting for the Force. The Chuilek Leku were very interesting organs. Their ability to subtly use minute amounts of the force to communicate is arcane. I was able to detect the midichlorians within the Leku. 
They were isolated there though, there were no abnormal midichlorian count throughout the rest of the body, only in the leco and brain. Not enough midichlorians to be fully force sensitive. I was able to extract the midichlorians. I attempted to scan them and discover their genetic code to have for myself. My machines were incapable of unraveling the full genetic code to my surprise. The only way this could happen is if the creature is too highly evolved that it has touched outside the realm of mortality. Such a thing was impossible in my previous galaxy, as there were no immortals or non-mortal beings within. Now in the face of such a creature, I find myself a little helpless. I used every single midichlorian I could extract intact for experimentation. At the end, I only unlocked 1% of the genome. I growled a little in frustration. Experimentation yielded results unlike the plane scanning. It would take hundreds of thousands of experiments to unlock the rest of the genome though. I must also research the force energy itself. I think, I must hunt force sensitive beings in great numbers. If I wish to use the force directly without a medium of midichlorians, I must unravel their genetic code. Until then, I will need to research midichlorian transplants. Force sensitives are needed. I have knowledge of some beasts that are sensitive to the force. Akdog, Jocko Beast, Malraz, Storm Beast, Dizen, Vornskr and Crate Dragon. These creatures can provide me with the materials I need. Some of them are even immune to lightsabers. As for the wiki specimens, I will incorporate their hardiness into myself during travel. Their genome was easily unraveled. For now, the Chwilek genome will be put aside. My next destination is the home of the Akdog, Haruunkai. I initiated the QTE and went to my lab for biological modifications. By the time of arrival, my skin and bones had become more durable. I had still retained my same looks though. I wouldn't want to get any uglier now, would I? The planet was covered in a toxic cloud sea. Life was only supported on the plateaus that made it above the clouds. I ran a surface scan to see which plateau had some ekdogs on them. All of them apparently had some population of them. There were also plenty of settlements. It is a midrim world after all. I take a scout ship to a plateau with a low population of inhabitants so it'll be easier to avoid them. They were just humans anyways. I was looking for a lone ekdog, an outcast. Trying to get one away from the pack would be difficult. Their hides are lightsaber immune. They are not small creatures either. They are large predators, tall, and very strong bodies full of strength. I do not have confidence in killing it with my plasma weapons. So I must trap it, then kill it. I was lucky to find a lone neck dog soon. I approached cloaked, but as a force-sensitive creature, it sensed I was coming. It went on alert, as expected. There were trees around, strong trees. I had made a trap where a wire lasso was hanging. I will run the beast into that thin wire and tap its neck. Then I set up a pitfall trap beneath that would activate. The beast would then be hanging by the neck. Finally, I will bind its tail and legs. That's the plan. I uncloaked, and started running after I threw some throwing discs to anger it. I went through the trees, just out of its reach. It was fast, but so was I in my techno armor. The lasso tightened and the pitfall activated. I then fired more wires with hooks from my gauntlets and pulled hard to get the limbs under control and tied down to more trees. Now, the ek dog was sprawled out in the air. It would die by hanging, hide too tough. It will be immobile though. Now to figure out how to kill it. I wish to keep the brain intact, so I am left with one option. I say out loud in my guttural language, plasma cannon down the throat should do. I jumped on the held up dog, pried its jaw open with great difficulty and shot plasma down its throat. Two shots were enough to kill it. I got the dog down and called my scout ship for pickup. I dragged the thing inside. Once I brought it back to the mothership, I used a special high-powered laser powered by the ship power source to cut the hide. I took a cell count and found that the dog had 6,571 midichlorians. To be deemed force sensitive enough for training, the minimum is 7,000 per cell. This beast was only good enough to have force enhances senses. It was still a good haul of midichlorians. I sent half of them off for experimentation. The other half will be used in transplant research. As for the hide, I will analyze it and try to replicate the material. A good hunt, all according to plan. Chapter 8, Renvar. My next target is on the planet of Renvar, the Jocko Beast. A herd creature capable of using force push. They can even use force push together to create a strong repulsion that can shake a small forest or larger depending on the number of Jocko Beast. As for why Renvar and not Hoth, the answer is because of Solari. Solari is a type of lightsaber crystal. A crystal so powerful in the light side that it is impossible to bleed. To bleed a crystal is to corrupt it with the dark side and turn it red. This sort of crystal is extraordinarily powerful and coveted by the Jedi Order. The crystal was first discovered by Jedi Ulic Kaldroma after the Great Sith War in 3986 BBY. Now that I have interacted with the Force, and can recognize its energy field, I can scan the world for a nexus of the Force. I reckon that Solari will be giving off a huge energy field. More and more do I appreciate the time I spent reading Star Wars lore during my life as a human. The planet has much history, even the Rakuten Infinite Empire took control of the world in the past. It is quite the shame that they are all dead, none left to collect a trophy from. I input the coordinates of the world and wait a little while. I arrived on the world and scanned the world for a force nexus. I also scanned for clumped heat signatures. I found a nexus and clump of heat signatures together to my delight. I made way to that area on the surface in a scout ship. Renvar is a cold wasteland where everywhere is covered in snow. 
Only creatures such as the Jocko Beasts could survive here. A blizzard was going on, so I had my scout hover and I jumped off. I didn't want it to be covered in snow and give myself a pain in the ass. After I jumped down, I started to get my bearings and find the direction I needed to go in. As I turned to my side, I saw a group of heat signatures looking at me. I growl, Jocko Beast. The whole herd collectively force pushes me and I launch like a cannonball. I hit what is thought to be a mountain, as an avalanche fell on me as I roared in unwillingness. I get buried dozens of feet in snow and curse my luck. Angry, I vented plasma from my techno armor and shot wantonly with my plasma cannons trying to blast myself out. After a whole hour, I managed to blast myself out. Now free from my temporary grave, I roared into the blizzard with the desire of vengeance. I thought out loud with growls, damn Jocko beast? I'll skin your entire herd and line the halls of my mothership with your hides as rugs. I use my bio helmet to analyze the packing of the snow. The snow packs differently where it has been walked upon. Therefore, even though the tracks are covered, I can see under the snow layer and still get their trail. I start running in focused determination to claim their heads. I soon catch up with them as they were only walking. As they are a herd and tight-knit, I started blasting. I blasted a hole through the rear guard. Unlike the dogs, they do not have resistant hides. They attempted to force push me together again, but I wasn't having it. I did the signature predator super jump to avoid the push that cleared the blizzard for but a second. I blasted holes through two more. It was originally a herd of 30, now down to 27. I dodged the same way another two times, now the herd is down to 23. This is when they rushed. Jocko beasts are essentially saber-tooth tiger slash bovine hybrids. This made them large, fast ahead of two tusk, teeth, and snarls. I brought out my wrist blades and went into a melee with them. They stood my height while on all fours, so I could wrestle them. Problem is they came all at once. I put away my plasma cannons since they only make this hunt less fun. The first one I caught by the tusk, wrestled him to fall on his side and ripped its throat open with my wrist blades. I was blindsided by another and was tackled. It tried to maul with the tusk, but I blocked them and kicked off a little. I back rolled to get on my feet again. I jumped on its back and started ripping into its spine. Two more jumped me at once. The first one launched me into the air, the other caught by the leg and tried to gnaw into it. My armor protected me though. The first came up and tried to gnaw my arm. They both met my wrist blades and had their face cut up badly. A trio on my right force pushed me together and knocked me to the side a few meters. I was beset by a new duo. I kicked the first one in the head, hard, to stun it and stop it from getting on me. The second one lay on top of me and used its maw to try and bite into my head. Getting sick of their shit, I straight up used brute strength. I caught by the tusk, crunched by abdomen to sit up, and drove a wrist blade into its neck. I retracted the blade, got under it, and from a kneeling position lifted it above my head with a roar. I then threw the bleeding out Jocko beast into the herd, knocking some over. I roared again to taunt them and started to run straight into them again. A roar that roughly translated to, have at the you hairy, ugly motherfuckers, I'm having you all for dinner. I continued my fight with them. It was a wild fight of being force pushed, pounced, rammed, bitten, swiped, and wrestling. Speaking of ramming, when the Jocko beast managed to get a perfect hit during a ram with their tusk point. It is the tusk that channels the force too, which could explain why it slightly penetrated my armor and wound me directly to a small degree. Even with my more durable skin, it punctured in 3 inches. Manageable wound, but annoying because of the stinging. I quickly forgot about through adrenaline. After some more fight, there was only one Jocko beast left. For this one, I put away my wrist blades. It charged to ram me. I grabbed its tusk and moved to flip it on its side. As it was falling on its side, I jerked its head in the opposite direction. By using its own weight, and my hold on the tusk, I twisted its head enough in the opposite direction and to break its neck cleanly. Its death signaled the end of my intensive hunt. I roared in triumph that I bested all 30 of the Jocko beasts at once. My roar is upon a bloodied snow the blizzard cannot cover, covered by the bodies of the hunted Jocko beasts. Chapter 9, Solari. After the hunt of the Jocko beasts, I spent 10 minutes loading their corpses on my scout ship. I will be dealing with the bodies once I get back to my mothership. I still need to make my way to the Force Nexus and try to find a Solari crystal. So I trudge through the snow, using my ability to see the energy field of the Force and my hollow map to find the Nexus. My mothership scanners gave me a general location, but it's up to me to zero in. I eventually got to a point where I could see the energy field converge and get stronger towards the ground. I signal my mothership to to do a deep subterranean scan. A new cave system shows up on my bio helmet's hollow map now. I stand back a good amount of meters and signal my mothership to use its main plasm cannon to drill into the ground. In the first AVP movie, another mothership accomplished the same feat, so of course mine can do the same. It only takes a moment for the plasma beam to come down from orbit. One blink later, I got myself a tunnel straight to the cave system. I waste no time and jump into the tunnel. I slide all the way down in no time. My bio helmet has energy field vision installed as well, which only helps my own. As the cave is lightless, I overlay ultrasonic vision with it so I can see where I'm going. I follow a path that only increases with energy field intensity. I can guess that this is the correct path to the Solari. As I get closer, I get the feeling something is watching me. After a few more minutes of walking my techno armor is depowered. Now I'm left seeing through my bio helmet with my natural, but much improved red sight vision. 
My techno armor was made with this situation taken into account though. I have lost my use of its special capabilities, but it is still as strong an armor as any. I can move in it with ease still. My wrist blades still work too. I then hear an uncanny genderless voice, Hunter. I get low into a ready stance and pop out my wrist blades. My growls reverberating throughout the caverns. Hunter, I hear it again and start scanning my surroundings. I have been watching you for a long time Hunter. I know of all the species that inhabit this galaxy, but you are not one of them. I start to think about what or who this enemy could be. You are aware of me Hunter. You've been seeking my power for yourself for some time. Almost since you got here, it all starts to click. I relax and stand up while shaking my head. I then say in my guttural language, the force. Correct, yet not. I am but the will of the force, not the force itself. But the theology of myself is unimportant at the moment. What is important, is what you are, a hunter. I've watched you seek trophies, I've watched you hunt. I've seen you evolve after each hunt. Your ability to evolve yourself and become a better killer has caught my eye. Although still off-putting, the voice sounded more interesting. I say, if I have caught your eye, that can only mean you have found a way for me to benefit you. The force will hums, correct, but you must still prove yourself capable. If you do that, then I will issue you a hunt myself. At first, I aided just a little bit out of curiosity about what you would do. IT was after seeing your actions that I saw potential. I ask, what help? The voice tells, midichlorians leave the body after death you know. If I did not keep them there in the body, and alive, you would have been unable to experiment. I must admit, I was a little shocked you had managed to unlock even the smallest percentage of the midichlorian genetic code. Your civilization must be master bioengineers. That is not too much of a surprise after watching you evolve yourself though. This will of the force is correct. I had completely forgotten about midichlorians dispersing after death. I then say, then thanks for the curiosity driven help then. You must also know why I am here. The voice responds, you are after the solari force crystal. Which is no problem, but I feel you had it easy with the Jocko beasts. I feel like you should another creature in order to get the solari crystal. My quilled eyebrows furrow, what do you mean? The voice laughs creepily, I may have made a rather appear in these caves. That Rathtar may or may not have eaten the solari crystal. I snarl. You see hunter from beyond, I'm actually rooting for you to evolve further. That way you can succeed and become worthy of my hunts. Plus, anything can happen in the field, right? As a good hunter, I'm sure you're prepared. I'll be watching, good luck, the voice then has a feeling of fading away. I snort slash snarl lowly, while Hunter isn't wrong. I prefer Predator. I then hear the sounds of savage snarling, screeching, flopping appendages, and rolling flesh. I am still depowered, but that doesn't matter. The Rathar will die, guaranteed. Hear the sound getting closer. I get low and ready, wrist blades out. I see the Rathar barreling down at me now as it turned the corner. It stopped midway though. IT flopped its tentacles towards me and I was hit with force push. I growl out, it can use the force, Ryuk? Of course it can, damn it. You ugly ball of shit, I'll deflate your rolling aberration you call a body. I dead sprint at it. It sends some more force pushes towards me. My precognition kicks in and I dodge them with grace. As much grace I can manage with a 9 feet body, but still grace. I basically steal a move from Wolverine and jump out claws first in a glide. I stab into the top of the wrath tar and drive both my wrist blades in. A tentacle knocks me off almost immediately. I'm sent into the wall. The wrath tar rushes me with a flurry of tentacles. Just as fast, I meet them with a flurry of slashes myself. I cut up its tentacles. It screams disgustingly, before it starts regenerating its tentacles. I roar, force heal, come on. I go on defense, and take a look at my previous landed wounds on its top. They are already closed and no scars. Dodging, force pushes, tentacles and even rocks been sent at me, I come up with a good plan. Even though my techno armor is capable of forming a plasma cannon from reserve nonites, I always done a modified original one that is always shoulder mounted. I rip it off my shoulder mount and drive my blade into its power core to make it unstable. I can have around 10 seconds to get rid of it now. I rush through the Rathtar's attacks and get right in front of its mouth. It open wide just for me, how considerate. I chuck the unstable plasma cannon in. As it is modified to be more powerful, it'll make a big boom. It goes off inside the Rathtar's mouth and blows it into chunks. I predator laugh, good luck force healing from that you ugly mutant meatball that should be in the fallout world. I see a shiny golden crystal, ah, the solari. It really did eat it, damn glutton. Well, I have what I came for. I take a look at some Rathtar chunks. The Yautgea scientist takes over and I collect some chunks for genome unlocking. I severely doubt I'll want to incorporate any Rathtar in myself though. The hunt for the Solari is over and I even got a bonus, ugh. I got to respect its deadliness though. It wasn't unworthy. Chapter 10, Hounds. Having returned to my ship, I connected some carts together and piled the bodies on top. I take it all and dump them on a conveyor belt and hangers in my lab. I'll have them experimented on and have some midichlorians extracted for transplant research. I will be using hellhounds as guinea pigs. I can breed them as fast as rabbits and are easily modified. I go and take the fertilized eggs from a recently pregnant female of my pack. I will begin the process of splicing some Jocko Beast's DNA once it has been unlocked. A pack of hellhounds able to use force push with their horns will be a good asset. At the same time, I will give them the goat energy field sense too. 
This way, they can sniff out the more magical prey. The act dog skin will add it to the new hellhound generation too. As for the Solari crystal, time for some research on it. Over the next couple of days I did various experiments with it. The crystal is a conductor of the force, but not the living force. It conducts the cosmic force. One experiment I conducted is that I cut my hand deeply. I then held on to the Solari crystal and my hand healed perfectly. It is certainly the strongest crystal with the light side. Its natural force healing ability is strong. The Solari crystal is also a great power source. She used Kyber crystals to power the Death Star laser. This Solari crystal could become a permanent replacement to my battery chips I use to power my armor. The crystal itself is extremely hard too, it won't explode by being shot, hit, or sliced at. Such attacks won't even leave a mark on it by my calculation. It'll become an endless and reliable energy source for all my personal weapons and armor. It will also heal me as it'll on my person. Although my natural regeneration isn't bad, it's only a little better than a lizard. A force healing energy source is far better. The hellhound modification was complete over these days. The pups that came about had the skin of an egg dog, energy sense of a goat, and force push of a jocko beast. My transplant experiments yielded some results too. I set aside some hellhounds for midichlorian transplant. It was successful at first, but over time they became rabid. As for the why, probably because they were never theirs in the first place. Sheev and other Sith sorceries were able to do it. Sheev had that force cloning project. The sorcerers made force abominations. I will find a way. I took a day to modify my techno armor to take Solari as a power source. I ended up having to rip out almost all the circuits and redo them with different circuitry. They just couldn't handle the Solari's energy. That is mostly why it took a whole day. I was greatly satisfied though. My armor was reading full on energy. Everything was perfectly powered all at once, unlike before with the batteries. It took two weeks for the pups to grow into full adults. In those two weeks of waiting, I spent it training and studying the galactic map. I memorized coordinates, hyperspace lanes, names, places, and races. After those two weeks, I took the alpha of the second gen pack and had him breed every second gen female and two first gen females. I wanted to see if anything will come of a first gen and second gen reproduction. Sometimes, life can produce crazy things. The second gen hellhounds were 1.5 times larger. Stronger bite, body, hide and senses. I already knew of the perfect prey to test the hellhounds on. The Malraz, red scaled skin, cat like body, but with longer claws. They are also known as night hunters. They could use the force to cloak themselves and hunt it in packs. My new hellhound pack versus the night hunter pack. The Malraz home world is Tksun, the demon moon of Andoran. It is called that because of the Malraz and hostile nature of the jungle covered moon. That is my destination. I arrived in good time to Tksun. I put my mother ship in orbit and loaded a pack of male second gen hellhounds on board. The females were pregnant, so they won't be coming. I will not personally get involved in this fight. It is all on the hellhounds. Night hunters are not always cloaked. They only cloak when on the hunt or fighting. I was able to detect the life signatures of a, a pack of them because of this. Night hunters like any other pack hunters have a territory. I didn't the range, but I took an educated guess and loosed close enough to them. I pointed them in the direction of the night hunter pack. I growled out, hunt the red ones that hide. The hellhounds took off. I got back in my scout ship. I would be observing from the sky. The hellhounds were detected within 3 kilometers of the night hunters. I could tell because the night hunters cloaked themselves. One thing I noticed is that the hellhounds became a little more brutish in their movement. They lost some agility in favor of strength. Something that I may be able to fix by giving them night hunter DNA, as they are nimble. As expected, the hellhounds could not detect the night hunters. They could only discover their traces. This was further proven as each hellhound got jumped on by at least one night hunter. They all got jumped at the same time too. The night hunters are indeed great pack hunters for such coordination. The hellhounds shook them off though with no injury. The act dog hide I spliced them to have is resistant to lightsabers. Their claws and fangs won't work. The hellhounds were quick to set upon the night hunters. As usual, they went for the throat and then thrashed them around. Most of the night hunters that attacked died. The hellhounds overpowered them with strength and defense. They would have certainly died without the act dog hide I spliced into them though. The moon is aptly named. Normal people and creatures would quickly die here. I lowered my scout ship nearby, lowered the hatch and used my hellhound whistle to call them back. They of course carried back as many dead night hunters as they could. They completed the hunt, but only through force. They were unable to find them and only one because of their superior power. I'll have to further improve them. For now, we return. I returned to my mothership and immediately began unlocking the Malraz code. Chapter 11, Storm Beast. With the Malraz code being unlocked, it was time for my next target. The infamous Storm Beast. A product of Sith sorcery. They had become dark side aligned creatures as a result of the Sith. They are strong, 2 meters tall, green, reptilian, bipedal lizards with a long and large mouth. Through the dark side, they have increased strength, and a sonic attack. The force flows through them naturally to make them stronger than they should be. An ability I want. The sonic attack wouldn't be a bad addition either. Their home world is Malachavi, a ruined world. In the past, it was controlled by the ancient true Sith. They had an academy on this world. After generation, it became a nexus of the dark side. 
In the Mandalorian Wars, the planet was attacked with the terrible mass shadow generator, a weapon activated by the Republic side. They destroyed the world, instead of accepting a loss. Mitra Surik gave the order herself. The hypocrisy of the Jedi is a long-running joke it seems. As I was reminiscing, I had already put the ship on course for Malachavi. As always, we arrived timely as hyperspace lanes were not really required for my ship. The gravity of the world is unstable, erratic, and unpredictable. I did not get too close to it. I did a planetary scan from a safe distance. If I remember correctly, there should be a Mandalorian outfit in this system. I believe they were the Neo-Crusaders of this era, living here in exile or something. My scans detected an adequate enough concentration of strong life signatures. Only storm beasts have such a signature. My mothership's telescope gave visual confirmation. I will have to approach carefully because of the gravity. I growl, fuck that, time for some fun. With the Solari as my power source, I added some features to my armor. Before, I did not add full-on flight-capable thrusters because of energy consumption. Energy is no longer a problem. Therefore, I'm going to Iron Man slash Master Chief this orbital entry. I'm going to just jump off my mothership and let gravity do the work, ha 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 ha, I've always wanted to do this. I went to a hangar of my mothership, opened, and jumped out towards the planet. I wasn't kidding when I said I'll Master Chief this, I am the flying brick now. I would only use my flight thrusters to maneuver around space debris. I was shooting like an arrow, face forward, hands tucked at my sides, legs and feet together. It was a long ride on gravity to the planet. I take look around me and see the stars, the light of the sun, and the distant gas clouds. Even as a Yautjia, one of the few things I retained of my humanity, is the awe of space. The one thing I will always find beautiful and glorious. I am lucky to be able to travel it all freely. Back in my time as a 21st century human, I would have never been able to explore the stars. I would have died in some overtaxed house, or worse a home for the old, only able to look up at night. How cruel to tease my generation of space travel, only to go back to fighting over land, and the most ridiculous of things. Fucking politicians. I'm so glad I was reincarnated as a Yautjia, then transmigrated into this wonder galaxy full of prey. I approach the atmosphere after the few minutes of falling towards the planet. My armor takes the re-entry heat easily. For the fun of it, I land identical to Iron Man's superhero landing. To my delight, I land between two roaming storm beasts. Two meters is tall, but I'm nine feet tall. Nine feet converts to 2.7 meters roughly. These monsters are royally fucked. They come at me rapidly. I give the first one a solid punch to the throat. The second one got a spinning sidekick to the chest and was sent. I go over to the storm beast that I punched in the throat. It was still trying to attack, but it was losing strength and struggling on the ground. No breath, no strength. I simply ripped its head off. The other storm beast came back right after and hit me with a sonic blast. The attack was saturated in dark side energy. It made me slide back a couple of feet. Had I not have the Solari, the incorruptible light side crystal, that would have hurt me quite a bit. Lucky me I got it first before coming here. That screech would have killed or maddened normal beings, or even weaker Jedi, a truly worthy prey. I clashed with it and got its arm. It was indeed very strong, stronger than it should physically be. I am a little bit of a freak myself though, so I still overpowered it. I speared the beast with my hand, and ripped the spine from the front. The screech had attracted four more. I took two power discs from my waist and threw them. The discs went through each beast's from from the front and severed their spine coming out the back. The storm beasts are powerful creatures, but I'm just a bad matchup for them. Six bodies is good enough. I string them together and put them in a net to make them easy to haul. With my prize in hand, I fly up back into space. After a few minutes, I make it back to my mothership. I deposit the corpses in my lab or study. Products of Sith sorcery are good research materials after all. I then waste no time as my machines do their work. I put my mothership on course for the homeworld of my next target. The planet MYRKR. Chapter 12, MYRKR. Isalamiri, lizards that could push against the force to become invisible and unaffected by it. Unless, perhaps if the force user was much stronger could affect it. Anyways, I have jumped already. I'll be at MYRKR very soon. Arriving over the world, it was a simple matter to find some of them with a planetary life scan. They were many. I went down in a scout ship personally to grab one. They were more or less harmless to me. I would be grabbing two or three for the research. The trees did interfere a bit with the scan though. They have high metal content and mess with scanning systems apparently. I worked around it all right though. Landing on the planet's surface, I got to work chasing three down. It was easy enough. When I finished my little easy hunting, a certain pack of predators found me. Vornsker. Whip-tailed, gray-skinned dogs with the ability to sense slash sniff out the force. The Asalamiri evolved their force suppression to combat these dogs. Their spilled blood properly attracted these dogs since their ability was turned off upon death. It was a small hunting party. Six Vornsker, all hungry and ready to fight. They rushed me. A bad decision on their part, but they're animals. Six dogs, six bisecting slashes of the wrist blades and six dead Vornsker. I took their bodies too. Maybe their detection will boost my goat energy sense for the force. I did want to see one city before I left, Hyliard City. A smuggler city, and one of the only cities on the planet. Criminals and the unwanted frequent there. The planet itself was rarely visited. 
This was literally the only city on the planet. The city is connected to the Hollow Net. The planet resides in the Inner Rim. The Vornsker naturally see Jedi and Sith as yummy meals for their Force sensitivity. This world seems like a good place to make a permanent base. The more I thought about it, the better the idea sounded in my head. Then I thought about the needy, the natives that left his world for an unknown reason. They are a force sensitive race of sentient plants. A good example would be roughly like Groat. They were shapeshifter and long lived. They were an old and powerful race. Although they were not numerous and reproduced rarely as they live very long. It makes me wonder why they left this verdant planet. Anyways, I will this planet my base in the inner rim. There is a mountain range a few hundred kilometers from Hylierd City. I'll bore a hole that runs underneath them and park my mothership within. I'll create some drones with my onboard mini factory. It can only churn out a handful of droids, drones, or robotics an hour, but it's good enough. I'll do some proper base building once I get some construction bots working. The trees will be good building material and help keep my base hidden. As I'm close to the city, I'll be able to visit anytime and connect to the hollow net. Or I could properly hook into it from my mothership. I can't underestimate word of mouth though. The smugglers and underworld denizens will have good information in their bar talks if I listen well. I return to my ship promptly and deposit my spoils to get my rewards out of them. I head to my mothership's command room. I aim my super plasma laser slash cannon slash drill slash big gun that solves all my problems and aim it to bore beneath the mountains. Of course, I bore on the side that cannot be seen from the direction of the city. I press fire and a wide blue plasma beam fires for about 10 seconds. I then descend and fly my mothership into the perfect cave. It's very deep and very cozy. I press some buttons to get my mini factory working on building some construction bots. Since my spoils are being decoded and experimented on, I might as well get building myself. I can at least take some cloaking array nodes and set them at the entrance. I can also start cutting a couple of trees for materials. Not too many though that someone would notice though. I'll make sure to rip out the stumps too. Sigh, good old fashioned manual labor. How I missed this, I say sarcastically with my growls and clicks. Chapter 13, Machinations. With the base underway on MYRKR, I could leave the rest to the construction drones. I hopped in a scout ship, activated cloaking, and headed to Hylard City. Once I arrived in the city's airspace, I opened the bay door, cloaked myself and dropped into the city. I had the ship go hover outside city airspace until called. I toured the city. It was a city of scum really. Poor and the haggard all around. The only ones dressed okay were the smugglers, and unsavory types. There were some civilians, but they mostly kept their heads down. The spaceport was, adequately sized I suppose. As I continued to look around, I saw to my surprise a bounty hunter guild building. I didn't expect one to be on this frontier world. Granted, this branch was only in a rather small building. The doors open automatically, so I just walked in front of them and allowed my movement to be detected. The doors opened and I simply walked in like a regular invisible dude. The desk guy looked up from his hollow pad, seeing nothing he scoffed and looked down again. No one was in the guild branch besides this desk jockey. So, like any good 9 feet yautjia, I silently hopped over the desk. I smashes the desk jockey's head on the desk, knocking him out. I analyze his setup. I quickly find that the hollow pad is connected to the guild's bounty system by a hollow net. As a genius member of the Dark Blade clan, hacking this little hollow pad is trivial. I hack the hollow pad and access the registration page. As I am using staff privileges, I can fill out and submit the bounty hunter registration myself. I did plan on becoming a bounty hunter, but I didn't plan on doing so on this world. This is convenient for me though. The application allows you to withhold a lot of information, such as race, appearance, age, and work address. I only input my hunter name which will be Predator. With branch manager privileges, I don't need a picture submitted either. I finally issue myself a membership card slash number. I lucked out this guy was also considered the manager of this branch. I take my ID card and skedaddle out of there. The manager shouldn't remember anything, and even if he does, he can't undo anything. Now to create an access point to the hollow net. The other objective I came here for. Rather than always hacking my way in, I want to modify a physical access point that'll always allow my connection. Therefore, I'm off to the city data center. The data center only has one guard sleeping on a chair, haha. I even let some humorous predator clicking out loud. The sod doesn't even wake up from that. I walk straight past him into his server room. My cloak rendered the security detection tech moot. I went over to some servers and opened a few up. After some tinkering, I'm now a world holonet admin, hee <laughs> hee. Now I can always access holonet on this planet. That means I also control what information goes in or out of the holonet system. I'm going to be through and go take control of the long-range planetary transmitters. They are separate from the holonet system and can still receive and transmit data. Once I get that done, I have information control on the whole planet. This is so easy as there is only one city with such facilities. I start leaping over to the long-range transmission station. It was close to the data center. I am aghast when the station on has two guards and three staff. I know the city population isn't too large, but come on. There are definitely enough people to place a guard at every door at least. What a crappy local government. I sneak in no problem and get inside the control room. Along the way, I saw a board with the schedule on it. With a glance, I could see I snuck in during lunch break. So when I entered the control room, it was empty. I got to work tinkering about. 
Five minutes in, I'm done. The station is under my shadow control. This planet is mine now. I start a hearty laugh as I turn to leave. I hop up on the roof the station and call in my scout ship. It comes over, hovers and opens its bay door. I hop in. In the Yaojia tongue, now it is a viable plan to make this into a reservation world. Jungles, forest, mountain ranges, and plains. Low population, information control. I can do it. Chapter 14, Legend. Back at my mothership, I was planning. My plans were simple. Further increase my hold on this world. Gain a reputation in the galaxy as a bounty hunter. All while waiting for cannon to begin. Once, the Nebu blockade happens, I'll make my way to Tattoo 9. For now, let's begin my legend. Over the years, I would take bounty after bounty. Each one harder than the last. Scum, smugglers, gang leaders, serial killers, rapists, and villains. The one bounty that really made me famous was a cult leader bounty. The planet was Tauber, a world that specialized in medicine advancement. An important world to the Republic. A cult had risen on the world. The cult of pestilence. They preach that disease is natural and should be embraced. That medicine is an upfront to nature and other delusional shit. Cults like these are usually weak and harmless. This cult has become militarized though. They are somehow being equipped with heavy blasters, tanks, and rocket launchers. One of their primary targets has been the Neurosov Corporation, the leading entity of medicine on the planet. It is obvious to me that the cult is being used a corporate proxy army. The cult is no joke anymore. A Knight Padawan pair of Jedi were sent to solve the problem, but they have failed so far. This resulted in the Tauber government issuing a bounty for the cult leader's death and the elimination of the cult. The cult members are around 5,000 in number. Right now, they've holed up in a natural valley and fortified the place. They even have ray shield generators covering the valley. Security forces can't get in. The Jedi are always forced to retreat. I accepted the bounty and my codename was shown on the bounty page. Predator has taken the bounty. I leave MRYKR in my mothership. The construction bots have already built a small factory area in the cave. They can continue production and construction without me. While traveling I decided to choose what weapon I will use. Looking at my rack of weapons, I come across a pair of whips. I made this weapons has a fun side project. Whips are not used very often. I did learn how to use them very well though. These whips are made from microblades. The microblades can rearrange themselves during an attack to make sure the edge is always pointing at the target. A kind of smart metal. An elegant weapon. I will use a this pair of whips then. I put them on my hips and head to the hangar bay. I've almost arrived. I take a scout ship down to the surface. I then start moving towards the back side of the valley. There is one entrance on that side, but it's small. Perfect for my entrance though. It was day, so I just observed the valley until nightfall. To my pleasure, rain started to fall as the light left the land. I have always considered rain a good sign during a hunt. It makes things more fun. I enter through the back entrance now. I break through the doors with punches of pure strength. The cultists inside were bewildered and didn't know what to do. I throw some shuriken inside to clear the hall of cultists. Then I walk through to the other side where the main camp is. Alarms are already going off. I am still cloaked so no cameras were seeing me. I do pat myself on the back a lot for improving my cloaking technology. No camera, infrared, water, sound, heartbeat, energy detection or the like can perceive or mess with my cloak. Only direct fire contact and energy disruptors can mess with it so far. First thing I do is go around and set some tiny bombs on the ray shield generators. I then activate them all at the same time and the shield drops. Rain intrudes on the camp now. Looking around, I would say most of the cultists are outside now and warily looking around. On top of a building, I take hold of my whips. I then announce myself with a resounding predator roar. I hop down and start whipping. The tails cut through the air and five are dead. Then six, seven, four, ten, three. Every strike take multiple cultists down. They all start panicking as the only thing their eyes can catch is something swishing through the rain. They start panic shooting all around them. I just keep flowing through them, using my whips dancing around. I would make one hell of waterbender, haha. This went on for I don't know how long. Not even the rain could wash away all the blood anymore. Then I cleared out the buildings and tents for stragglers. There were some children which were left alone. Some cowering women were left alone too, most likely dragged along by family. One good thing is that all the actual cultists were fanatical, none ran. They all stayed to die for my convenience. I made my way to the largest building. Inside were better equipped and trained cultists. They were nothing to me though. Cut apart like all the rest. I made it a important looking big room and my main target was within. He was holding some crappy bloody sword with crazy eyes. His guards looked crazy too. He yells, I know you're here. Show yourself. I click clack and think, I guess broken minds are more sensitive to some things, mmm. I don't oblige him though. I merely flash my green visor in front of all of them. All of them start running at me wildly with vibro machetes. A few whip attacks and all the crazy bastards are dead. I sigh and take the head of the leader. I can't keep it as it needs to be given as proof. I don't even want it though, the guy was pathetic. I walked out. It was still raining but some sunlight was on the horizon. Looks like I took the whole night. I do wonder why no security forces or Jedi came around when the shields were dropped though. Odd. I get in my scout ship and head to the capital city. The Tauber Prime Minister is in his office. 
I sneak in and set a head on his table with a small note. His eyes go wide in surprise that a head appeared out of nowhere. I leave and didn't wait for him to read the note which read, Predator has completed your bounty, pay up. I leave the planet and go back, home. I access the hollow net from my base and see if anything is being said about me. There are indeed things being said to my interest. The surviving women and children are describing me as a phantom. They call me rain spirit, water ghost, and hail me as being ruthless. It seems I've traumatized those survivors with my huge display. Well, I did make a bayou of blood spilled from 5,000 cultists after all. What a night. Chapter 15, Predator. My fame spread fast. The feat of killing 5,000 armed men in one night frightening. Especially, if you were never seen by a single soul. The Jedi duo assigned to the mission went back to their temple in haste I have heard. My feet even made the Coruscant news. I read a couple of articles. One claimed that the Jedi Council convened to discuss my feet even. Although, nothing was confirmed. My fame has reached such a height that I received a direct bounty request. The bounty was on a Busodian Jedi Knight, a Karki Handrel. The requester is of course anonymous, and the bounty wasn't registered in the public bounty boards. It was a private request after all. I breathed out in excitement. Then I read how they wanted the kill to be proved. Dash method of confirmation, head. I low growl as I would have preferred to keep the head. Whatever, I'll keep the lightsabers as my trophy then. Not too unlike the infamous General Grievous. I would like to meet him once he make his appearance. We're not so unlike, except for his cowardice at times. Quick to run when disadvantaged that one is. I take inventory of my current abilities. I had decoded all the previous hunted force beast by now. I have yet to improve myself again though. Once I do, I'll gain force push, force cloak, force suppression, and even the sonic roar. I accept the bounty request and head to my lab for my genetic upgrades. In my lab I hop into a casket where I'll be undergoing modifications. I lay down in this chamber and relax. 24 hours later, the work is done and I rise. A medical report is prepared for me. I scan over it and see everything went well. The new genes even allowed me to have midichlorians of my own. This is a surprise. Although I reason why this is. My being is foreign to this galaxy, hence midichlorians could not be accepted into my body. Now that I have given myself genes from force beasts, my body has become more accepting. I am no longer completely foreign to the force anymore. One could say, I snuck myself into the power. My midichlorian count is now 4,500. Not enough to train in the force, but enough to use my genetic abilities. I test out the abilities I should have gained and am delighted that they all work okay. Only restriction I found is that I cannot use force abilities if I have force suppression active. It makes sense though, so I'll take it. The Busodian was currently on a mission on Umbara, a planet that has become increasingly dissatisfied with the Republic. The Jedi was sent as a diplomat. Information shared also showed he was accompanied by Temple Security Forces, TSF. A squad was given to him for personal security. Should be easy enough. I have my mothership leave MYRKR and jump to Umbara. I was there in a jiffy. I descended in a scout ship over. Additional information in the request stated that a Kark would be leaving the capital city to visit a politician's mansion in a rural area. The time I read put me two hours early. Now I just waited hovering above the route they would be taking. Right on time I see a short convoy of speeders. Simple formation, TSF guards in the front and back, Jedi Knight in the middle. Many miles away from the capital city, I make sure I grab my plasma sword. I had chose a plasma sword this time around. A single-sided straight sword, with a plasma edge. It can be wielded with one or two hands. Normal ones are retractable and only one-third of the sword has a metal edge. Mine is not retractable, all the blade is plasma edged. The plasma can be turned off and on though. It can be imagined as a Chinese straight long sword mixed with a katana point. Ready, I jump down in front of the convoy. First speeder, I stand my ground and let it ram into me. I full on stop it in its tracks. The other speeders tried to go around, my plasma caster shot them all in the rear end. This rendered them all disabled. The TSF started getting out of the speeders along with the Jedi. I'm cloaked and using force suppression, so they're all looking around. They're all armed with blaster pistols and rifles. I don't need to hold back. With my great strength, I am able to break necks, stop hearts, and crush chests with a simple punch. I don't use anything but my metal-covered fist. I start going to each guard and breaking their bodies with my flurry of fists. I move fast, whenever they shoot in my direction, only air is shot. The Jedi tries to catch me, and he gets close as my movements are not completely concealed. I still take up space and affect the ground. The Jedi has 20 eyes and trained senses. He also still has access to force speed. It seems my suppression only affects external force abilities. He never catches up. He tries to catch me up until every guard is dead. Now it's just him. In basic, he yells calmly with a stoic face, show yourself, who are you? The Jedi has balls, I'll give him that. He is still serene through all the violence, respectable. I uncloak in front of him. He readies himself as he sees my nine feet armored, powerful form. Through my bio helmet I speak in basic, I am Predator. His 20 eyes light up in recognition. He says, so you are the bounty hunter that killed 5,000 cultists in one night and killed the leader. I wasn't aware there was a bounty on me. My name isn't on the bounty board. I clack and answer, you're correct. This is a private and direct request. 
Nothing personal night handle, I'll make sure your body is found in a timely manner. I will also let them know what happened to you. Unfortunately, I will have to take your head with me. He laughs, such respect, haha. <laughs> you are no common scum, you are a real hunter. I understand you a little now. Well, then predator, time to work for your kill. I click sometimes and take out my plasma sword. I take a stance and advance first. Advancing overhead downward slash. A lark uses force speed to keep up with my own speed. He dodges the heavy strike. I pull back my blade and send it out in a thrust to his chest. He parries that thrust with his single blue lightsaber. I quickly recognized his lightsaber styles, a blend of Makashi and Sorso, a blend best against a single opponent. He dodges my heavy strikes perfectly and counters elegantly with great precision. My own style is quite advanced and I'm fighting in way suited for duel. Yet, I am being matched by this Jedi Knight, not even a master. I incorporate ground stumps in my footwork to crack the ground and shake his flow. It doesn't work. I mix it up and throw some shuriken in between attacks, he cuts them down smoothly. The knight's performance is proving to me that this version of Star Wars is one where Jedi are not so mortal as seen in canon. This Jedi is powerful. His stamina is not as high as mine though. Soon I see him losing strength, but he doesn't get sloppy. After minutes of exchanging, I manage to knock his lightsaber aside and get close. He tries to bring the lightsaber back up, but I'm too close. I grab the hand that holds the lightsaber. My sword held by my right is brought back from my waist and thrust out into a lark. The Jedi is finally bested. He says nothing and only closes his eyes peacefully as he drops his lightsaber that switches off as it hits the ground. I catch the knight so he does not hit the ground, and lay him down. I beat him, but not because I was the better duelist, it was because I had more stamina. Now dead lay around me on this dark world, with a fallen knight at my feet and my hunt complete. Chapter 16, The Umbaran Incident. The TSF, I had no care for their bodies. The Busodian Jedi A. Karki Handrel however, I begin to care for. My care is expertly removing the head and laying out the body in a visible but resting position. I took some clothes and put them underneath the now headless body for it to rest on. Then I leave my mark on the ground next to the corpse, easy to see. My name, Beto, in Yautjia writing glyphs colored a neon green. The language has never been seen in the galaxy. They won't be able to decipher it with only four glyphs. My bounty finished, I promptly left the scene. I took the head to a meeting point in the Umbaran capital city. A place in the underworld of the city. A heavily robed figure approached the meeting point. The being was waiting and looking. I am cloaked and unseen on the wall. I drop the head right in front of them. The being is startled, but quickly recognizes the head. It looks around before calming down. Seeing no one, it speaks in basic, confirmation completed, you'll receive your payment soon. Good work. It then takes the head in a bag and walks away. I do not care for the identity of the being, so I just leave. I go back to MYRKR as I don't want to be around for the fiasco. Once at my base, I do take a look at the galactic hollow net. Reading through, the Republic was in an uproar. Days going by, people were researching. The Republic authorities were looking at all my previous bounties. They had even linked my past hunts to my bounty hunting style. I was traced all the way back to my fun on Ord Mantle. While it wasn't publicly stated, I am sure they know I killed of Kadi Mundi's wives. The Jedi even made an official action against the guild to hand over all information on me. The guild complied, but of course my information had only my name and ID number. It had no picture nor address. Nothing was there they could use to find me. Some of the better news entities managed to find out that the guild offered to excommunicate me from the guild. The Jedi refused so they can have a way to know what I do. I won't stop taking bounties though. The news in the underworld is that Black Sun has issued a 500 million credit bounty on me. They aren't paying in Republic credits either. I suppose killing a council member on Ord Mantle would elicit such a reaction now that they know who did it. My assassination became known as the Umbaran incident. Umbara itself became even more troublesome from my actions. To stabilize the political climate, two Jedi Knights and one Jedi Master were sent as diplomats. They managed to calm the political climate. What helps me is that the Republic slash Jedi have been looking for me in the mid and outer rim. They're not even looking in the inner rim the fools. I'm in their backyard yet they don't even care to look in it. Arrogance and stereotypes like this is why this current order will fall. As a hardened Zabruk once said, there is no order but the one that will replace it. Maul will be a good meeting. I won't hunt him down though. His death by the hand of Kenobi was something I liked. A fitting end to their tale. I will get rid of some Jedi that would die in Order 66 though. Better dead by my blades than by a blaster bolt to the back. I am entertaining the idea of maybe saving Ayla Sakura though. Given, I can shake her Jedi ways and have her become mine. She'll be suitable for starting my own clan in this galaxy. Although, if I fail to make her mine, I suppose I'll have to be satisfied with another. As her skull would become my trophy is that is the case. Predator cackling slash laughing ensues. Chapter 17, The Force Unleashed. I continued my bounty hunter ways. MRYKR became more and more controlled. Hyliard City was put under my direct control already. The mayor mysteriously went, missing. A new election was proposed. In said election, I promised a candidate victory if they obey me. I was anonymous when I did this of course. Even if I have full information control of the planet, I don't want to risk anything just yet. The woman slash human, was a greedy young scum. 
He had little support, but still ran anyways. He was confident in winning through any means possible. Such ambition and resolve is, useful. He had no shame or pride either. The result is a puppet mayor I control. The city is mine. My underground base was coming along nicely too. I had even gotten enough material to start producing something useful. Androids. Wayland Udini in the spacefaring human age created androids. Humanoid robots with synthetic flesh and blood. An AI installed meant to replicate human behavior. They only managed to achieve ace that were mere imitations, and never succeeded in making them fully human. The AI will assist me in having androids that can blend in. I just need to tune the AI listen and think independently to a controlled degree. I don't need it to be very powerful. What I am interested in are the combat androids seen in the AVP games. That is what I'll be making. They will provide planetary security. They will look and act human. This way, it will be hard to suspect their true nature. Then I'll move on to infiltrator models. The androids will be my hands and feet. All the while, I will stay a ghost, a spirit, a specter, the unseen hunter. As a genius of the Dark Blade clan, a clan with the best technology, I can do better than humans slash humans. Although, I will not be continuing the name of my old clan. I am only the elite rank. Yet, as the only Yautjia here, I can call myself a Yautjia king, yes? Not, nah, naming myself a king is pushing it. The king back is someone that would fuck me up even now. Hundreds of years of hunting and training on me. Plus, all the weapons he would have collected. Plasma melee weapons are not the cream of the crop. Anyways, I'll just make myself a leader rank Yautjia once my clan begins. I still need to think of a name though. Another exciting development is my midichlorian research. I had some of my cells have midichlorians transplanted into them. They wouldn't work at all before. Now that the force beast genes have been added to my genome, the cells can take midichlorians. However, most still don't hold. So I came up with the idea that I need to make myself more, native. My genetic code has not evolved along with the force, so it can't hold it at all. At least that was before. Now it can hold a few thousand, but not enough to train beyond the beast abilities. My solution, add native genetic code to my genome. This should allow me to become fully force sensitive capable. My original code will also adapt and undergo induced evolution through this change. I take Syrian, and Chwilak code to use. None of my genetic modifications have changed my appearance, and neither would this modification. Finally, I take to the modification pod. I rest in it for 7 days. As not only was I undergoing evolution, but also midichlorian transplant right after. Once I awoke, I looked at my hollow screens to see the result. The modification was a success. The transplant was also a success. I now had a count of 30,000 per cell. Force God is 40,000 and above. I'm 10,000 below reaching the highest power tier. Now I can start training the force. While the androids are being designed and produced, I take my other time to train. I found out that it was difficult to use the force. I was making slow progress, because of one reason. I can't meditate for shit. I have allows been active, doing something. I am only still when I am asleep. Always training, researching, playing, or fighting. Meditation is a huge part of training in the force. Having so many midichlorians makes me powerful but more power means I need to train harder to get better at control. I need my own way to meditate, Sith meditation by itself is a no, Jedi meditation is a no too. I need a personalized meditation method. I start to pace and think about what brings me emptiness. I get a light bulb. I clear my mind whenever I am doing my weapon forms, or just weaponless forms. I head to the training room and pick up a regular glaive. It is the weapon I know best. Although I do want to get better with the sword too, I head to the middle of my training room with the glaive. Then I start my weapon form. Sets of movements, weapon attacks, blocks, and stance switches. As I do them, my thoughts fade away as my body rehearses ingrained movements. With a clear mind, I begin to feel the force. I have successfully begun meditation. I have found my meditation method. A method similar to the force power of battle meditation. I meditate for hours. Once I stop, I feel much more in control of my power. I can better feel the force. Discovering how to do the more advanced force abilities on my own will be tiresome though. I need to find some holocrons, or manuals. Sith or Jedi, I can use either. Time to visit some old worlds with long history. Chapter 18, Getting Some Holocrons. Ledev. On this planet is an abandoned Jedi temple. A temple the Jedi would not search for until the start of the Clone Wars. A master and Padawan. Grievous would then track them and try to hunt the duo down. Grievous would stumble upon the temple at that point in time. He then ordered an orbital bombardment to destroy after he exited the temple. Now, I will get there before he even becomes General Grievous. I'll be able to scavenge what leftover knowledge was there. As the androids were in production, I left MYRKR with peace of mind. The planet was also in the same region as Umbara, curious. The space flight was uneventful. I had done a planetary scan for structures and force nexus points. As the temple was built on top of a force nexus, it found a match quickly and descended in a scout ship. The temple was overgrown and dusty. The statues were cool though. Walking through the temple, I was cloaked to be safe. I was looking around for the library section. It would be where I would hollow crons. I found the library section. Walking into the it, I was hit by a force vision of the past. It was only flash, but it felt like I had gone back in time. I was disorientated for a second. I kept walking to the holocron vault doors. 
I was startled by a greeting. Hello there. I turned around and subconsciously said, General Kenobi. This elicited a chuckle from the voice. Funny, but no. I am not Kenobi. Haha. Ha. The voice shows itself to be the Force Ghost of Omen Jedi. I say to him in Galactic Basic, a Jedi knowing becoming a Force Ghost is exceedingly rare. I did not expect to meet you here. The Jedi laughs, well, I didn't expect to meet you here either. But this temple is my old home from days gone past. Having someone enter it, Force sensitive too. I got curious. I do not recognize your species though. I ask him in a little surprised, I am cloaked, how can you see me Jedi? He scoffs, your cloak is indeed genius, but still no match for the Force. A Force ghost like me can of course see through it. I don't think any Jedi save Yoda would be capable of the same thing though. I decloak as there no point for it to be active. I continue walking and the spirit asks, so what are you here for young one? I growl, I am here for holocrons. He asks, why? Why not go learn from the Jedi? I growl again, because the Jedi will fall, and the Sith will follow. I will not learn from dying orders. Although I still come for their knowledge in the form of their holocrons. I could learn the force powers on my own, but I don't want to spend a 100 years doing so. He hums, well, there are some leftover holocrons in the vault you're going to. The vault is locked though. I laugh, no problem, also, I'm not young. I'm 180. Well, I've actually been here for almost a year now, so I think I'm 181 already. Point is, I'm not young. He does an old man laugh, well, you still act young, so you're young. I hope what you're looking for then, umm, boy? I don't know what you are so I'll just call you boy. I scowl beneath my helmet, Beto, call me Beto. The spirit smiles, well Beto it is then. You can call me Kaljuren. Well, I'm going to get going then. See you Beto. The spirit of Kaljuren leaves. I look at the vault door in front of me. I use a laser cutter and cut the lock and hinges. The door falls and I have access. Inside are 12 holocrons. I pop out a bag I brought with me and threw them in. Satisfied with my hull, I get back to my mothership. Next stop is Exegol. I punch in the coordinates and start the QFD. I sit back in my command chair and relax. My peace is interrupted though. Hello there. Chapter 19, Getting Some Holocrons PT2. I let out a startled roar as I look to my right. There he was, the Force Ghost. I say, what the fuck are you doing on my ship you dead old man? Can't you just rest in peace or some shit? Cal Jiren laughs, I am at peace. I am also resting. I'm just resting on your fine ship and finding peace and looking out at the stars. Cal Jiren then sits down and a ghostly rocking chair appears under him. I am flabbergasted, did you just make a rocking chair appear in my command room? How are you even doing that? The dead old man smiles, the force is in everything kid. So it stands to reason I can make a ghost rocking chair appear. It is not that hard actually. So, where are we going? I grumble but just accept it, Exegol is the destination. He nods, the hidden Sith retreat planet. Going to scoop up some of their holocrons too then. I answer, yes. He says, Exegol is a dark place Beto. That Solari you got powering your armor will protect you, but still be wary kid. I'll be with you. Cal Jiren says before him and his chair fade away. I mutter, whatever dead guy. I get to Exegol, it is a crappy world. Cool looking if you're an edge lord of the Sith or Goth, but still crappy objectively. Landing on the planet, I am just outside a Sith temple. Huge grey statues line the path. Walking in, I again try to find where the holocrons are kept. Or maybe a tomb for me to raid. After walking around the dreary place, I see a big locked door. I growl, hell yeah. I bring out both my plasma casters on my shoulders and fire. The decrepit door is destroyed. Inside, is only one holocron. I take the holocron and move on to see if I can find anything else. I come across a peculiar shrine. The shrine has a statue that I recognize, but can't put my finger on it. Marka, Ragnos. This a shrine to Marka Ragnos? Indeed it is, intruder, a raspy venomous voice says. I turn around and activate my force suppression bloodline power. I then see the force ghost of Marka Ragnos. He is one of the few Sith to actual achieve this. The power to become a ghost is usually reserved for Jedi. Hopefully the suppression will keep him from touching me or something. This guy ain't no modern Sith, he's an ancient badass. You recognize me child? I am surprised, you are no Jedi nor a Sith. You are a killer though, I can sense that much. You have a Sith holocron with you too. Why are you here? Marka asks. I relax and attempt to walk around him, I am here to speed up my training, and that is all. Knowledge is just that, knowledge. This is something neither the Jedi nor you Sith understand. Marka follows me with his gaze, oh, I understand. If I hadn't, I would not have been able to become a ghost once my life ended. Although I was going for immortality. I scoff, even immortals eventually die Marka. I continue walking and Marka walks after me. I ask, why are you following me? Can't you go back to being dead now? Marka laughs, I am dead, and I am following you because I am trying to figure out what you are. I growl lowly, have you heard of the Yu Zan Vong? Marka Ragnos thinks for a second, the outsiders from beyond the edge of the galaxy? Yes I know of them. I nod, then consider me as an outsider too. There are none like me nor have there ever been any. Since I think you'll insist to bother me, call me Beto. Marka laughs, okay Beto, you interest me. It is almost time for changing of the age. I have a feeling that you will do great things. So take this Beto, my personal holocron. 
I stop and turn, I am not one to reject power, but yo have another thing coming if you think a holocron is enough oh make me fall. Marka laughs, it is precisely for that reason I am giving it to you. Within is knowledge, and only you can use it fully. A Jedi would lock it away and forget about it. A Sith will close-mindedly learn it and toss it aside. I click my mandible, reasonable. I turn and head to walk out of the temple. I am done here. Hello Mark, I hear a familiar voice say. Damn it old Jedi fool. I am Marka, not, Mark. I've told you before insufferable old man, yells Marka. I sigh tiredly, you two know each other. Pal Jaren smiles, yeah, Mark and I have been buddies for a couple of centuries. Not a lot of force ghost you know, especially Sith ones, so I went to make friends. Marka grumbles with vitriol, I am not, your buddy. I can tell that the old man is just going to continue trolling the Sith Emperor, so I keep walking. They both walk behind me. I growl in annoyance as they follow all the way back to my mothership. I can't get rid of them as of yet, so I got to tolerate them. I just head back to MYRKR, I need some sleep after this trip. Chapter 20, Force Abilities On MYRKR, Bido slept a whole night. When he awoke, no ghost was in sight. He went to a training room he had built in the cave base. This way he doesn't have to worry about damaging his mothership when using force abilities in the mothership's training room. The androids were being produced nicely. Five units have been made so far while the rest of the factory area is being built to completion. As the factory machines are mostly making builder bots and other building materials, only a small number of machines were tasked to build androids. At the new training grounds, Bido took out his holocrons and placed them on a table. Twelve Jedi holocrons and two Sith holocrons. Starting early, are we? I sigh slash growl as I turn around to see Cal Duran. I say, I like to be productive, unlike a lazy old man who likes to bug the living. He laughs, don't be like that young un. I can help you train your light abilities you know. I was quite the teacher when I was alive with creaking bones after all. I scoff, I won't reject help from a presumably knowledgeably force user like you. About time you made yourself useful. Cal Duran, my friend. Trying to get ahead of me I see, Mark Aragnos appears too. Cal Duran laughs, of course you would make this a competition. How very Sith of you? Marcus scowls, how very Jedi of you to pretend you aren't secretly competing with me. Hypocrisy. I finally growl, enough you two dead things. I awoke to train, not hear you two argue like a divorced couple. Now shall we get to learning and teaching. They both nod. I say, good. Let's pop open a holocron then. The ghosts both stop me, wait Beto. I turn to them and beckon them to speak. Cal Duran speaks, let us first explain to you the abilities and powers of the Force. Mark Aragnos and Cal Duran then explain to me all the, the powers of the Force in one long lecture. Note, a lecture I will not be writing. It'll be a whole informational essay, and I write enough of those for school. So just read the article in the link to see my source of info directly. You all are welcome to comment any abilities or powers missing. HTTPS colon slash slash starwars.fandom.com slash wiki slash force underscore power slash legends. After the lecture, I started opening the holocrons. Some of the first abilities I was trying to learn was force precog. An ability to predict movement to a certain degree. An ability widely used in lightsaber combat. Force grip and push were other basics I was learning. Force healing was a niche ability I was trying to learn as my first advance power. Cal Duran proved a good guide. Marco was understandably good as explaining how to learn force grip and push. Training took up my days, weeks, and months. I seldom took new bounty hunting jobs. For two years, I trained mostly non-stop. I had progressed quickly with two centuries old masters of the force. Or thousands in the case of Marco Ragnos. I learned, mind trick, force stun, force orb, and force binding for my light side powers. I learned, force wound, force drain, dark energy trap, force choke, and force destruction. I was till getting a hang of force lighting and electric judgment. They are hard to use. Dark energy trap is a Sith sorcery ability, one that would have been very hard to learn without Mark Aragnos. I have to terms with the fact that these two old ghosts are my teachers. I've come to respect them, although I still berate them for acting like children at times. Today, is a milestone in my training. As such, it is time for the next step. Marka tells me, you have progressed greatly in both the light and the dark sides of the force. It is time for you to create your lightsaber, or other weapon. Doesn't really matter that much now. Tradition is for the old order, not the one that will replace it. Cal Duran speaks next, you have expressed desire to create a glaive. The glaive you are familiar with has blades on both ends. It is possible to create such a weapon using kyber crystals. Do you know what crystals you will use? I smile underneath my bio helmet. Crate Dragon Pearl and Ghost Fire Crystal. Chapter 21, Crate Dragon Pearl and Ghost Fire Crystal. Having decided what crystal I am going for, I leave MRYKR. The Ghost Fire Crystal will be the first one I retrieve. All I have to do is find a good mountain on an outer rim planet after all. The planet with suitable mountains I have chosen is Lamu. Some may recognize it has the plant the Erso family escaped to after the Clone Wars. This world should have a Ghost Fire Crystal. Arriving at Lamu, it was a beautiful ringed planet. I landed near an old and large mountain of the planet. I used the force as a guide to the ghost fire crystal as I was led into a cave. Once I entered deep enough, I was led to the ghost fire crystal. It was a translucent misty white color, as if it would fade away in a blink of an eye. 
Hence, I grabbed it quickly just in case it faded away. I exited the mountain cave with my prize. Now I have the ghost fire crystal. Next is the crate dragon pearl. This will be a task. A task because I will going after a greater crate dragon. A 100 meter 10 legged sand dragon that is a truly mighty beast. Its pearl would be of a much higher quality. So I headed to Tatooine in my mothership. Greater crate dragons spend most of their time swimming in the sands. Hence, I took a scout ship to the middle of the dune sea. On the sand, I started to stomp foot repeatedly. This way, I could attract a greater crate dragon is I'm lucky. I was stomping my damn foot for so long the twin suns were going down. I growled in annoyance at how long I've been doing this. I've been using the force to increase vibration strength too. I sensed a large creature approaching in the distance. I ready a my combi stick. This model has plasma enhanced spear ends on the end for better penetration. I ready myself, as I watch a large body rise from the sands. The greater crate dragon is truly menacing in the flesh. Even I am intimidated by this powerful apex predator, that is legendary throughout the galaxy. I am confident in defeating it though. It isn't like it spits fire, that's just a fable. Its poison spit is easy to avoid. Even though crate dragons are attracted to places strong in the force, especially the dark side, they can't use any force abilities themselves really. It stares right at me and growls. I growl back, cocking my arm and throwing my combi stick right between its eyes. Hoping to kill it in one go, the combi stick hits, but is deflected. I think internally, what the fuck? That should have been a weak point? How is the skin resistant to that? It isn't that much weaker than a lightsaber. It should have at least been stuck. I bring out my plasma cannons and fire off a short barrage at it. The damn thing is a little singed, but relatively unharmed. I roar out, how the fuck are you this strong? You may be legends, but even in legends you weren't this strong. The dragon snarls and I feel the dark side empower it. I see a blue light traveling up its throat in arcs. I mutter out, ah fuck. The greater crate dragon breathes force lightning out of its mouth at me in a roar. I throw my hands up to absorb the lightning storm being directed at me. Just because I haven't learned force lightning yet doesn't mean I don't how to defend against it. This is a shit ton of lightning though, I don't know if I can hold much more. Luckily the lightning stops. I then send back the lightning that was absorbed in my hands. It hits the dragon and cause pain to it. I smile underneath my bio helmet, it seems force abilities still work on it. I am not going to underestimate it anymore though. It shouldn't be able to use force lightning or be so tough. That Jedi Knight should not have been so skilled in dueling either. I thought I was just in Legends Star Wars. Now my eyes are open. I'm in Legends Star Wars on steroids. I bring out my wrist blades and run to the dragon. I avoid the head, and go for the ten legs. Less movement means an easier time for me. I quickly discovered the blades couldn't penetrate. So, I did an experiment. It was rough, but I barbarically coated my wrist blades in the force. Using them again, they could cut. I laugh, you are weak to the force, dragon? Your head is mine and so is your pearl. I hop, run, and climb all over its body, striking the legs. All the while avoiding lightning from its maw and bites. As its neck is long, it can turn its head to see me. Its lightning doesn't seem to hurt itself though. Down to four legs left after half an hour, I got cocky. That cockiness caused me to be struck with the lightning finally. I was thrown off the dragon's body by the bolt. The air left my lungs when I landed in the sand and my body was painful everywhere. Force lightning hurts like you're being bit by bullet ants at your every nerve. I had to get up to dodge the incoming lightning though. I roared and got back to it. I started to use force wound, destruction and drain to damage it during all this too. Its vitality was enormous though, so it wasn't enough despite all the damage I did. After an hour of fighting it, its legs were all crippled. I was using the previously mentioned force abilities to hurt it, along with my force covered wrist blades. The fight lasted 3 hours of me injuring it on the outside and inside to kill it. I even got with lightning a few more times. Once it dies, I was extremely tired. I had pushed my stamina to the limit and my body was in great pain still from being struck with lightning so many times in those 3 hours. I needed to finish though before I could rest. I called down my mothership and used drones to start the long process of dissection. It took the whole night, but I got the pearl. I got the greater crate dragon skull. I got a truckload of highly rich meat and some potentially exciting DNA to research. I finally headed back to MRKYR. In my base, I took off my armor and went straight to sleep. I was so tired. Chapter 22, Light Glaive. Once I awoke, the two ghosts were looking down at me. I growl out, out of my face dead people. They back off with Cal Duran feigning offense. Marka just scoffs. I walk over to my restroom to wash my face. Marka asks, ready to make the lightsaber now. I chuckle, oh yeah, and I even have the perfect material to make the base pole and handle. I put my techno armor back on. I then read a report on the crate dragon materials. I explain, the greater crate dragon has strong bones. I could rend the flesh, but I could not harm the internal bone even with force enhanced blades. The pole of the glaive will be made from the crate dragon's dick bone, hee <laughs> hee. Marka spits out, what the fuck? Why would you do that? Cal Duran just starts rolling on the ground laughing. I continue to explain, some creatures have a bone inside their penis. It serves many purposes that aid in procreation, such as helping to keep an erection. For the crate dragon, it helps keep their massive dong straight. It was also tested for durability and weight compared to other bones. It is the lightest and also the most durable. 
It seems the crate dragon evolved to make sure its dick isn't cut off or something. Funny, isn't it? Hence, the pole will be made from the penis bone of the greater crate dragon. Deal with it. I walk to collect the bone and talk. The secondary material will be the wood from the native trees. The wood messes with sensory technology that isn't tuned to adapt to it. This way, my weapon will become somewhat undetectable by technology. I get to the material processing bay and grab the penis bone. I cut a piece, and then start grinding it into shape with a diamond grinder I am enhancing with the force. Marka grumbles, your logic is sound, but it is still ridiculous to use a penis bone. Hours of grinding later, the bone was ready. Then I took a diamond drill, enhanced it with the force and started to make the emission holes down the middle. Then I cut the middle of the pole to make room for the ghost fire crystal and crate dragon pearl. I then gathered all the technological parts, the crystal, and wood parts too. I also grabbed some black staining paint. I sat down in my workshop with all the parts laid out in front of me. My two ghost master were watching with interest. Using the force, I began to construct my light glaive. The two crystals resonated with each other when they were put in the power chamber. The wood and bone parts then covered them after the electronics went in. Then I put on the emitters on both ends of the pole. The emitters were also made using the leftover bone. They were like a slit so the blade can take a shape in certain way. The blade ran down only one side of the pole. The back side had the same emitter too. The other end of the pole was constructed the same, just see image, this is hard to describe. When the construction was finished, I turned it on. The pearl normally makes the lightsaber sound loud and strong. The ghost fire crystal would nearly completely silence the lightsaber sound. The resulting sound was like a faraway whispering howl of a breaking wind. Something you would hear but not care to react to. The ghost fire crystal would turn a blade translucent and create illusionary after images. The pearl I used was black, so the blade should be black. The result was that the glaive blades were a thin smoke that you would lose track of as if they weren't there. I gave it a twirl and it felt so natural. I have never held a glaive that felt so natural for me to use. It was perfect. Finally, I stained it all a nightly black. Now it was complete. Marka comments, a unique weapon, a strong weapon, excellent work. Cal Duran for once seriously critiques, this light glaive you made is powerful. It is also leaning more to the dark side. Your armor's Solari crystal will balance it out well though. Good job Beto, this weapon will become legendary. I am satisfied, chapter 23, Jedi run in. With my weapon made and my mastery in the force adequate, it was time to take in more bounty missions. Previously, I had only done easy and quick ones. Now I have time for more time consuming ones. I look over the bounty board. I see a bounty for a hut crime boss active on Relith. The requester is one of the larger Twi'lek militias. Quite bold of them to put down their name when targeting a hut. I laugh, I'll take this one then. As I walk into my mothership, Marka pops up. He asks, so, how tortuous will the death of the hut be? Will you pop his organs one by one while keeping him alive? I sigh, no Marka, playing with a slug is not my idea of fun. Seeing a hut squirm is disgusting, and they sound disgusting too. I'll destroy his heart, take his head and be done with it. Then Cal Duran pops up next, a hut crime boss, hmm? Well, I have dealt with my fair share of those in my day. Nasty creatures. I put in the coordinates for Relith as the ghosts hang out beside me. Arriving at Relith, I already knew where the hut had made his base. The hut is called Flava, a distant cousin of Java apparently. Flava's base is located inside a huge canyon. Its main door is in the side wall of the bottom of the canyon. The main door is the only apparent way inside. Such a door is nothing to me though. I am excited to finally bloody my new light glaive, it still needs a name too. I'll name after this bounty according to how it performs. I take a scout ship down as the old ghosts just look at me go before fading out. I take the scout ship for a flyover. I cloak and find that the light glaive is cloaked too. A good thing too because I forgot to check if cloaking will work on it. I don't have it land as I just jump out of it and do a shock drop. I don't make a sound when I land though. I deploy thrusters to ease my fall. Then the force to make it quiet. The outside of the door is quiet and there is no obvious activity. Using my bio helmet, I use x-ray vision to see through the doors. I'm a little surprised they aren't leaded. Inside, I see Wiki, Rodians and other such species that you see among pirates. Even Trandoshians are here. I go to the, the right side of the door and force pull a panel off. I see a power control box and praise my luck. A simple bypass makes the door open. I then crush the power box once the door opens enough for me to fit. This way, they can't close it. The criminals inside are all bewildered and seem to think it is just a door malfunction. Some come over to the door try and fix it, but hear some mandible clacking. One of the Trandoshians looks at the door opening and sees me flash my visor green. His face fills with fear as he screams while scrambling back, Predator. His scream gets everyone out of their lull and rushing to arm themselves. I activate my light glaive and start the first blooding of my new weapon. I cut through the criminals effortlessly. Now that I can use the force as a sort of combat instinct, my techniques have become sharper. None of the criminals are of any import though. They are all just goons. The light glaive makes the goons a little hypnotized too with its sound. They miss or just look like their mind is somewhere else, and even scream PR panic. A curious affect of the sound. Uncloaking the light glaive, the effect was even better as they saw the dark smoky blade move. Very curious. I've made my way to the hut's throne room and force push the doors in. Flabba is flanked by his green pig guards that squeal annoyingly as I cut them down. 
I uncloak as I walk up to Flava. Flava starts to beg in his Waba Daba Chudi Hutu sounding language. I stand with my face an inch away from him and shove a blaster I picked up into his hands. He is confused for but a second before I crush his heart with the force. Dead. I then cut off his head with my light glaive. I turn back to see two Jedi behind me. I am distressed that I didn't feel their presence, but then I notice who they are. I say out loud in basic, Master Dooku and Padawan Ki Ganjin. What an unexpected pleasure. Dooku raises an eyebrow, you know of us, Predator. I nod, indeed I do. You were trained by Yoda after all. What I don't understand is why you're here. No Jedi had been dispatched here as I did Chak. I also took the job without alerting the guild publicly. So why? Dooku grins, I had time and felt Jedi interreference in this matter was necessary as this is a hut after all. I am silent for but a moment, well, as you can see, the hut problem has been dealt with. The bounty issued has been completed. I will be taking my leave then. It is now Kigan that speaks up, you've killed a Jedi Knight, and Master Mundi's wife. What makes you think I'll let you go? Mundi's wife wasn't a bounty either, so you can't just excuse it as business. I laugh, well, I think I can go because I want to. As for why I killed Mundi's wife. Kadi Mundi is a prick and his wife was worthy prey. Her skull is mounted in my ship, haha. <laughs> Dooku says to Kigan, Padawan, we will not fight him here. There is no need for conflict. I sense his strength. We are at a disadvantage. He can use the force, and is not a novice. I applaud Dooku, Keen senses Dooku. Dooku then turns to me, make no mistake though Predator. The Sentinels and Shadows will be after you now. They are no strangers to hunting down rogue force sensitives like you. I scoff as I walk past them, let them try, I will outhunt them with ease. Good day Jedi. I leave the planet with my hothead and contemplate this encounter on my way back to MYRKR. Chapter 24, Next Steps. Sitting in my captain's chair, I tapped my armrest. Dooku and Kiganjin had entered the hut base without me knowing. They got around my biohelmet force sense, my energy field sense, and my force sense. All abilities I had added to my repertoire. Kal Jiren and Marka rematerialize beside me. I say to them, the Jedi got around my senses. The only way for them to do that is if know how to conceal themselves within the force. An ability, as I understand, is virtually non-existent in the current Jedi Order. As have not been challenged since the defeat of the Sith a thousand years ago. Kal Jiranison wears, well, you are right. Master Dooku had indeed learned such an ability. As for why, I could not tell you. Marka adds, that Jedi is careful. He had taught his apprentice how to conceal himself too. A curious Jedi. I muse, I knew Dooku was a reputed master and talented duelist. I did not expect this ability of his though. At least not so early. Another thought enters my mind, MMM, Aeola Sakura should be born this year too. 49 BBY. The time will soon be upon us. I then criticize myself, I have been too dependent on my new abilities. I must not forget my roots. Had I placed micro cameras or even motion sensors, I would have been snuck up on by the Jedi. My oversight will not be repeated. First and foremost, I am Yaojia. I enter the MYRKR system and descend to the planet. Walking into my base, I overview the production of the androids. I have hundreds of units ready to go. These initial androids were built meticulously, as they are meant to be indiscernible form living beings. They can eat, piss, shit, talk, feign emotion at the highest possible level. They even emit normal body heat levels and can feign sickness. They can even simulate the aging process to make it appear that they age. They can even restructure their looks so they can fake death and start with another identity. They are the ultimate infiltrator models. Not all of them look human either. I will spread them across the galaxy to insert themselves into governments, the Trade Federation, Mandalore, and the future separatist planets. It's time to truly take over Hyliard City. I activate 25 androids. I select a human-looking one programmed for leadership. This is the android that will take over the city once the current mayor is disposed of. The other androids will kill and replace the operators for the communication stations. Information about their lives have been uploaded to their memory. The wives, husbands, and kids will not know the difference. They might even like the replacements better than the originals, hee <laughs> hee. I give the order, infiltrate the city and take control of your assigned positions. The 25 then begin to head to the city. Once they're done, I'll use the spaceport to spread the other androids to the stars. Now to address another problem. The Jedi Shadows. The Jedi Shadow is a Jedi dedicated to hunting down Dark Jedi, and previously, Sith. They are the hand that eliminates threats to the order and the peace of the Republic while operating underground. In this era of peace, they are few. I expect that they are Jedi greatly skilled in combat and more uncommon abilities. The Sentinels are another problem. They are on every planet with the Republic. The more populated the planet, the more Sentinels are present on it. This makes doing bounties within Republic borders, a little complicated. If my presence on any of these planets is discovered, the Sentinels will all come to attack me together. I am no longer just some dangerous bounty hunter. Now I am a rogue force user that's killed a Jedi. The zealous Jedi will eliminate me just to make sure I have no chance of going dark. I growl out, they will fail. Another, not so threatening problem, is Jabba has issued a bounty. Hot elite bounty hunters are now trying to track me down. They will never find MRYKR or think of it. Although, leading them to a decoy planet to turn the hunt against them may be fun. 
The planet that should be used as a decoy is up in the air for now. Marka speaks from my side, I think it is time for us to improve your understanding of the Force. Kaljaran agrees, yes, you are diligent, but lack deeper understandings. Understandings that require you to experience things beyond your current lifestyle. Marka speaks again, your inability to use Force Lightning is from lack of hate, and understanding of hate. You do not understand deep hatred, or unimaginable suffering. You have seen it or felt it. You must find those that hate to their core, feel fury down to the soul, and suffer so bad they relish a second of reprieve. This way, you can understand the dark side. Tal Jiren speaks, you know no love Beto. You view people as trophies, and life as tools to harvest. You have no one to protect, to save, to fight for. You can heal, restore stamina even. Electric judgment, force protection, plant surge even, force stasis are all out of reach. You must find those that love deeply, protect fiercely, and respect life greatly. Those that can show compassion to anyone and everyone. This way, you can understand the light side. I sigh, troublesome, but I know you are both right. My understanding is lacking, and meditation will not help too good with this. Witnessing, interacting with such people will instead work well. Finding such people will be a chore though, I'll manage. Once the androids are deployed, they can assist if need be too. Speaking of the androids, they should be done replacing people by morning. I don't really have much to do until then. Might as well meditate while doing katas with my light glaive. A slow, it is time to name it. I have used it, and know its qualities. I say aloud as I hold my weapon ignited, you shall be named, Destined Death. A homage to a story I experienced in the past. I think it quite fitting. Chapter 25, Alderaan. Under recommendation from both Cal Jiren and Mark Aragnos, I sought to improve my understanding in the light side first. When asking for guidance on where to go, Cal Jiren recommended, go to Alderaan. The people there are peaceful and compassionate. Art and philosophy thrive on that world. The world produces a great amount of diplomats and peace brokers. They have learned to thrive along with their environment, and can be considered harmonious with nature. Watch them, maybe speak with them if you deign. Such a recommendation was sound. Making a small base on the planet wouldn't be difficult either. The security forces can be considered good, but not good enough to hinder me in building a base. They don't have the technology to detect me either. MYRKR was already fully mine no. The androids had all finished their insertion into positions and identities. I've become the shadow ruler of MYRKR. I can leave the planet at ease. I didn't dawdle going to Alderaan, I left immediately. Getting to Alderaan, I decided to make base in a mountain range near Aldera, the planet's capital. I can exactly use the mothership's laser to make a hole, so I'm going simple. I take only a scout ship down with some supplies to make a camp. Landing in a good spot, I set camouflage nodes around the decided perimeter of the camp. These nodes will bend light to make an illusion that the landscape is normal, therefore hiding whatever is inside the perimeter. The nodes can also confuse people to walk around the hidden camp. I don't think it'll work against Jedi though. No Jedi should wander out here though. It was night when I arrived on this part of Alderaan. By the time the camp was finished being set up, it was almost morning. I went to Aldera to see the city wake, and tried to spot someone to learn from. As the people woke, the streets started to get filled and even music filled the air. Music that could be considered, classical, contemporary, instrumental even. Only in some area there were bards singing songs. I even began to smell the food. I had heard the Alderaan chefs make great food in general, but the smell took me by surprise. I started to get kind of hungry. In my great wisdom, I had actually sent some androids here. A few of them are even in Aldera. I chose one to call upon to order food and leave it for me. It took an hour, but was worth it. The food lived up to its reputation. I toured the city before coming across an old man in the street. He was wearing simple clothes and speaking to a small crowd. He was sitting in a small city square upon a simple chair. Listening in, he was talking about love and compassion. Two things I have only superficial understandings of, as I few all as lesser than me by default. Unless they prove otherwise. Midday, no one was listening to the old man anymore. He was just sitting there, looking at the sky. Without uncloaking, I speak from behind him, who are you old man? The old man looked behind him, and saw nothing. He did not react though, he was still calm. He faces forward again, I go by Bo, who are you? I think for a moment, Beto. I decided to show some sincerity, as the words of Bo were intriguing. He hums, Beto, I suppose you have questions. I answer, yes, I do. He hums again, ask them then. I ask, how do you show compassion to beings that are lower than you? Beings that are viewed as prey, and always will be. Beings that are not equal. The old man thinks for a moment, well, to show compassion, you must put value on their life. This means to value life itself. Even I, a big and strong human, can show compassion to ant. If an ant is stranded on a leaf, and flowing away, I would grab the leaf, and place it on solid ground. The ant is lower, lesser, unequal to me under you way of thinking, yet I still showed compassion for its life. Bo asks me, how do you live? I answer, I hunt. I hunt sentient creatures to improve my lethality, to become a better hunter. Bo asks unfazed by my answer, do you show respect, or hunt by any rules? I tell, yes, I have a code. Short version, they must be armed and combat ready. A trophy is taken from respected prey. I do allow useless suffering. For worthy prey, I offer a fair fight. 
Bow nods, then you have a respect for the hunt, a respect for the prey, yet you don't know how to show anything more. To show compassion according to your way, make the deaths quick, make them painless, let it mean something. Outside of the hunt, know that they all have something unique to them. If you see someone hurt, why not heal them? Are they not future potential prey? Isn't every life form potential future prey, even an ant? Perhaps, not prey for you, but prey for others, maybe they will become predators themselves. Nonetheless, they all have potential. As a hunter, why allow such potential to be snuffed, when you can give it a chance to grow? I think, what you say makes sense. I was expecting you to convince to change into a monk or something. To tell to stop hunting sentient beings. You instead suggested ways to fit compassion into my own way of life. Appreciated. Bo smiles, compassion can be found anywhere. It is not impossible for you, to be a compassionate hunter. You already have respect, you can do compassion. I say, tell me about love Bo. How can I love beings I hunt? How can I even consider being in love with females of species I have hunted? How can I love life in general? Bo inhales, a heavy question. What you are asking me is basically if a bear can love a fat sheep. For you, I would recommend seeing past the species, and looking at the person. There are exceptional people in every species. As for love, love is complicated. To love life, is to recognize what life provides. Life, is the reason none of us are alone. There are animals, trees, grass, and other people around us. This way, we are never alone in living. Life provides sights to the eyes, things to taste, breath to feel, song to hear, and beings to find solace in. This is why life should be loved. As for loving a singular being, I must refer to the phrase, falling in love. Do you know it? I click my mandibles, I know it. Bo continues, it is phrased that way for a reason. Consider falling, that act of falling is an action of vulnerability. When you are falling, you can be attacked, you can be strode over. To willingly fall, is an act of surrender. Hence, we can say that falling in love is an action of surrender to love. If you truly love someone, you surrender yourself to them. You render yourself defenseless. One thing you must understand Beto, is that it is impossible to truly love without surrendering. If you start to love a female of a hunted species, it won't matter that she is from an hunted species. This is because, if you pursue the love, you will fall. You will surrender in the end if you pursue it to the end. At that point, being a hunter, a killer, won't matter, it won't stop you. This is because love can be considered a form of madness, hee <laughs> hee. A slight pause, beware though of love. If you fall in love with someone that will stab you in the heart, instead of carefully handling it with reciprocal love, you will suffer greatly. Such a blow when you are surrendered will be unlike any other you have felt upon the flesh. Which is why, you must make sure, you surrender to each other. Do not try to seek love so hard either. Love comes naturally, so let it happen naturally, or else you have a higher chance to be stabbed in the heart. Now it I humming, thank you Bo. Bo smiles, no problem predator, come to me again if you like. I am always here. I am a little startled, you know of me, and can tell who I am. Bo chuckles, I am not ignorant of such fields of knowledge. I am wise enough in my years to conclude this too. Don't worry about me telling you name though. You came to me for wisdom, I will not betray that flattery. I laugh, alright then Bo, until next time. Leaving behind Bo, his words had got me thinking in the right direction. Now I must look for some experience. Just from meeting Bo, I think I will be able to find enough experiences on this planet. Big thanks for tuning into today's audiobook. Special shout out to our Patreon member whose request brought this novel to life. If you're interested in making your own personalized requests, consider becoming a Patreon member. You'll find the link to my Patreon account in the video description. Your support truly makes a difference, and I appreciate you being here for this audiobook adventure. Until next time, happy reading.